Sorry about that. I believe that life begins at conception, and scientific fact establishes that. Uh, we're no longer living in 1973. If you look at an ultrasound from that time period, you really can't see a whole lot. If you look at an ultrasound today, take 15 weeks, which is well before viability, the point in time when the Mississippi's Gestational Age Act applied, you can clearly see your baby move and stretch. She can hiccup. Uh, she can quite likely feel pain. Uh, there's no question that that baby is both fully alive and fully human. Is there, is there any instance of a woman giving birth to something that is not a human being, a baby, like, I don't know, a turtle, or as our first lady suggested, a breakfast taco. I mean, is there any instance where other than a human being has been born? Well, there are definitely are instances where people have stillborn. I'm, I'm I, still I, a baby. I, I guess the point it's is... still a person, is it not? I, if, if I can finish, I, I actually think that Representative Shannon's point about viability is, goes to exactly what you were naming. When the court no, I'm talking about personhood, not viability. Line, it did so because the consideration was whether or not the fetus can live outside of the body. There are many people who cannot live without no insulin. Does that mean we should uh, kill those people who cannot live without insulin? Well, there's no or way other, for them to live. Listen, my, I, I, this is my I time. I, oh, I thought you were asking us. I, so I was wanting to have an opportunity to explain. So it's not a question of turtles, or I'm, I'm not really sure. What it is a question of is, It's a question of personhood. That's what I'm getting to. And there's not an instance that I'm aware of of anyone giving birth to something other than a person. So well, if it is a person after birth, it by extension is a person before birth. I really hope people are watching today because the question on the table is about abortion for sure, but actually the conversation you're having is about contraception, it's about in vitro fertilization, is about a whole larger No, set of no, you mischaracterize. I'm table. having a clear discussion about abortion and the fact that it is a person. It is a person that we're dealing with, and that person uh, after birth clearly is a person, and therefore by extension before birth is also a person. And the question comes down to, when does a person have the right to life? And uh, ha when does a person have the right to health care? And we can argue all day that, it's, that abortion is health care. It certainly is not health care to the baby. Health care protects life. And abortion, by definition, destroys life. It is not health care. But if we're talking about a person, which we are, we're not talking a taco. We're talking a person in the womb. We're talking a We're, fetus, which is let me, the Let me ask term. you, let me go back, Ms. Hawley. You brought up this issue of health care. Let's talk about health care uh, and the baby. Uh, what, what is the, the issue resolving, uh, involving abortion and health care and the baby? So there's a the few time things. has expired. The witness may answer. Okay. So I think there's a few things on which we need to set the record straight. One, that an ectopic pregnancy treatment for that condition never involves an abortion. If you go to Planned Parenthood's website, they make clear that treatment for an ectopic pregnancy is not an abortion, or, or at least they used to. I know there's been some scaremongering going on. Uh, the same is true of a miscarriage. Uh, an abortion is a situation in which a child, as the Supreme Court explained in Dobbs, is purposefully put to death. It is the intentional destruction of a human being. Neither miscarriages, nor medical emergencies, nor ectopic pregnancies involve that situation. Gentle ladies, time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Krishnamurthy, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for having this important hearing. Um, Ms. Lopez, I'd like to direct your attention to this graphic that I have brought uh, here. Basically, it, it talks about the number of arrests of women for abortion, miscarriage, and pregnancy-specific crimes in the United States. In the 30 year, 32 years between 1973 and 2005, there were 413 such arrests of the women who, were, who had these different procedures. 
Between 2006 and 2020, so in 14 years, there were 1,331 arrests of women for these procedures. So in 32 years, we had about 400. And in the succeeding 14 years, there were triple that number, namely 1,331 such arrests. Now, are you concerned that in this post-Roe world that we're living in, in all those states where abortions are being banned, that we're going to have uh, an increase in the number of arrests of women for such procedures? Thank you for your question. Um, I am absolutely concerned. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that, especially in Texas. Um, it's essentially been a case study for what a post row world has been, even before SB8, based on the restrictions. But since SB8, we have seen immense fear and grief and isolation um, from pregnant people who desperately need help and do not have the means of leaving the state or the city they live in to access care. Um, I also think that um, bans and restrictions on abortion do not actually stop abortions. They just, as we see there, make it more difficult to access care and make the idea of criminalization far more of a reality. Representative Shannon, if abortion is made illegal in Georgia, are you afraid that women in Georgia will be prosecuted and imprisoned for seeking these types of procedures? worried about that. Um, and we do know that from 1973 to 2005, um, the instance of low income and particularly black women were disproportionately criminalized for having miscarriages. What a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the same uh, medications that are used for a miscarriage are also used for medication abortion, which is typically performed at home. And there's really not a way to determine if someone had a miscarriage or if someone had an abortion. And so what we do know is that our criminal legal system is really good at locking up black and brown folks. And so I am very worried that when a person has a miscarriage, and they are interrogated by law enforcement or they are prosecuted, I'm very worried that our criminal legal system will likely believe Karen, but not believe Keisha when she says she had a miscarriage. Well, Ms. Gosgraves, let me just ask you a question. Earlier you were uh, asked the question, what does, this, uh, what does abortion have to do with health care? My understanding of this situation is that we're talking about the health care of the mother. And in so many instances, uh, to protect the life of the mother, uh, an abortion, un unfortunately, is sometimes required. Can you speak about that and how in that situation where protecting the life of the mother might lead to the mother in jail? You know, when Professor Goodwin was here, she said twice a statistic that I'm still startled by, which is that black women were 118 times more likely to die from giving birth in Mississippi than from abortion. And there are a lot of health instances that come up. Pregnancy is an inherently risky endeavor. And, you know, it isn't the public Not story. for the male, for the female. For the pregnant person, right. For the person who is carrying a pregnancy, it is inherently risky. And, and the idea that there is no mention of the life or the health or the mental well-being either in the Supreme Court majority opinion or in the remarks and That's why earlier. the majority of Americans think it's radical and extreme. And so let me just ask you this question. These prosecutors who are going to go after all these women, we know the number of arrests are going to skyrocket very shortly. All those overzealous prosecutors and law enforcement are going to go after women. They're going to want to get their data. They're going to try to go after their data, which has often been entrusted to big tech, app companies, that keep their sexual health information and reproductive health information. Uh, Chairwoman Maloney and I have launched an investigation with regard to protecting the privacy of that information. Uh, could you please comment to me, uh, Representative Shannon, on the importance of protecting the privacy of that reproductive health information? Well, protecting the privacy of reproductive health information is not only important, but it's also important to protect privacy for all healthcare decisions. And that's why we keep reinforcing that the choice of whether or not to carry a pregnancy is a healthcare decision, and it's important that every person in this country experience the freedom of privacy to be able to make their own healthcare decisions with their own processes without government getting involved. Thank you. Thank you. I Thank yield. you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman, is recognized. Right. First of all, I'd like to refer to a letter here that I'm going to submit to the committee uh, from a group called Family Action 
or Wisconsin Family Action, Wisconsin Family Council, which I dealt with a lot when I was a state legislator. Uh, they were attacked with Molotov cocktails in Madison, Wisconsin. The reason I, I bring it up is not just that they were attacked, but the apparent lax or uncaringness of the law enforcement in Madison, Wisconsin. This is a disturbing trend we've seen around the country. Uh, we know there were a variety of cities in which riots broke out uh, a couple of years ago, including both in Madison and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Both times it didn't seem like law enforcement would engage the rioters. And I think the reason they didn't is that uh, the political leaders felt that if you were doing something that was the, the far left, which sadly runs your, your party today, uh, we will allow people to physically attack you, almost kill you in this case, and uh, we won't do anything about it. But I think it's something that should be in the record. I think it's something that perhaps other congressmen on this committee would like to read to see where we're headed as a country. With so I'd like to ask this letter to be sent. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, now, I have a few questions here. I know in Wisconsin, abortion was legal at the time, or abortion was illegal at the time Roe v. Wade went into effect. And in fact, the statute that was in effect uh, was put in place in, I believe, 1849, either 1848 or 1849. Could you comment on, in our country, the state of laws regarding abortions uh, at the time Roe v. Wade went into effect? Ms. Hawley. So absolutely. At the time Roe v. Wade went into effect in 1973, as I mentioned in my opening testimony, that decision, that judicial decision, again decided by seven male authors, overturned the pro-life laws of nearly every single state. If we look back in time to 1868, when the 14th Amendment was passed, nearly three quarters of the states criminalized abortion. Uh, so, so you just can't look at any point in our nation's history and derive some sort of right to an abortion. Uh, in fact, the opposite is true in our con country and the states have long protected life. Okay, and I, I believe there were what, either two or three states in which abortion was legal in, in 1973, is that right? That's correct, but with significant restrictions. Okay, uh, next question. Um, at the time, and you said this before, but I think it's something that merits people pondering on as to where we are in morality in this country. Um, the state of ultrasound today compared to 1973 when almost every state realized that having an abortion, killing that little baby, we've all seen the ultrasounds today, was a horrific thing. But could you comment on the change in the status of ultrasounds between then and now? Absolutely. So we've had 50 years of scientific advances, and everyone that's a attended a, a pregnancy ultrasound uh, at various points, you know, at six weeks, uh, you have the heartbeat. Uh, at eight to 10 weeks, most of your internal organs uh, for the baby are forming. Um, and now we even have three and 40 ultrasounds that allow you to see the baby's face. Uh, you can even sort of determine uh, what it is they are going to look yeah. like. So when they are much born. more obvious today that abortion is horrific than it was in 1970. Absolutely. And in fact, if you look at page two, I believe, of my written testimony, we have an example of an ultrasound in 1973 and one today at 15 weeks. And the differences could not be more stark. OK. This, this idea of abortion, and particularly even late-term abortion in places like North Korea, China, Vietnam, uh, some of the most repressive countries in the world. We know what's going on with the Uyghurs there in China. Uh, do you want to comment in general on the type of countries that would consider it important to legalize abortion? Absolutely. So we see totalitarian regimes uh, such as North Korea, such as China, who is not just totalitarian. I want you to comment on the belief in God. So, so I think we see in these countries the idea that life is not precious, that life is not valuable. Uh, again, if you what do they do to churches in North Korea or or, or China? Neither are churches uh, valuable uh, in North Korea or China. Right. People there, do the people who run the, run the country believe in God? So I, I think they prosecute the church there, sir. Right. Is there a correlation then between countries that allow abortions, late-term abortions in particular, and countries that almost the state religion would be atheism? So I'm not... How much time has expired? Briefly answer. 
really so one interesting thing is that when Christianity was born, um, one of the Roman culture that Christianity emerged from was one in which uh, was devastating to young children. Parents had uh, superintending rights. A child the, had no right to life. The gentle lady's time has expired. We have to keep into our time frame. Right. Mr. Raskin, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, nearly 8 in 10 Americans say that the decision about whether or not to have an abortion should be left to women and their families and their health care providers. 62 percent of Americans say that they support a nationwide law protecting a woman's right to choose consistent with Roe versus Wade, including not just the vast majority of Democrats, but 57 percent of independents and 40 percent of Republicans, although they don't appear to have much voice in the Republican caucus today. But there are lots of Republicans who agree with us that this is a choice that belongs to women, girls, and their families. That is the vast majority of the American people. Now, we want a nationwide law which codifies Roe versus Wade as a woman's right to choose because we believe this is fundamentally a question of freedom, personal freedom and autonomy. They want a nationwide law which makes it a crime to have an abortion anywhere, in any case, including where women and girls have been raped or are victims of incest. And that follows logically and naturally and honestly from their position, which we've heard represented several times today, that life begins at conception in every case. So how could you allow a woman to have an abortion in the case of rape or incest? That would be murder, is what they say. Now, Ms. Gosgraves, I'm worried about this. It was the founder of the Republican Party, President Lincoln, who said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Can we endure half free choice states and half theocratic compelled pregnancy states? Is that going to work for America? Like, what, what do you see as the future of this? And I am deeply worried. This is the first time in our nation's history where the Supreme Court has taken away a, a, an individual right in the Constitution, a right that two generations of people have come up for, uh, with. So, so now you have grandmothers looking at their grandchildren and understanding that they're going to have fewer rights. It cannot stand. And it's opening up a range of unprecedented legal issues that I never thought we would be dealing with. Whether or not you can travel and leave your state, whether or not you can be surveilled, whether or not you as an individual are truly free in this country, that is the debate we are having. All right, Senator McMorrow, I wanna to come to you because in a number of the compelled pregnancy states, they're already talking about passing laws to make it a crime for a woman to leave a state for the purpose of obtaining health care in a state where abortion is still lawful. And they want to make it a crime for people who enable them to leave the state, whether they're in another state or they're in that state. I've introduced legislation um, with a couple of colleagues, which I hope we'll be hearing this week or next week, to allow for the free travel of American citizens among the states for the purposes of obtaining health care that's lawful in the destination state. Is that something that you th would think is important in Michigan? I do think that it's important, but I want to take a step back too and remind everybody how devastating that is going to be for those who are low income, particularly women of color, younger girls who do not have the means to travel. And just to bring it back to an example here in Michigan, our Attorney General Dana Nessel has said that she herself in her capacity will not enforce the 1931 law, but she has also said that she cannot compel county level prosecutors to do the same. So not only is there going to be a difference depending on what state you live in or what state you're able to travel to, but down to your zip code, whether or not you can get direct access to care, whether or not you have access to physicians who are trained, who don't feel fear. And I wanna go back to the story that I shared in my testimony. McCall and Jordan shared with me that they learned that there were only four physicians in all of Metro Detroit who had been trained to carry out the procedure that they needed. More than almost half of the state's population live in Metro Detroit. 
that it's only four physicians for more than four million people. So we've Thank already you. seen this way. So I agree with you, but it's it's even much more local than that. Well, I appreciate that, Ms. Shannon. Finally, um, the Supreme Court has targeted the constitutional right to privacy more than a half century of precedent. Um, that constitutional right to privacy guarantees women the right not to be sterilized against their will, which is what happened to thousands of women in the last century, including in Virginia. Uh, do you fear that there are governments which are going to, on the one hand, stop women from making their own decisions about abortion, but go the, back the to sterilizing women? The gentleman's time has women? expired. The gentleman's time has expired. We're going to be enforcing the five-minute rule. Of can I okay. briefly answer? Can she answer the question? Very briefly. Sure. So we don't even have to go back years ago to forced sterilization. We actually had this happen in Georgia in an immigrant um, detention center in Georgia where um, folks were forcibly sterilized. So that's a real threat. Okay. Jill, thank you. Um, Mr. Jordan from Ohio is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Hawley, is the left trying to intimidate the United States Supreme Court? I think if we look at the evidence from the last few months after the leak of the Supreme Court opinion in Dobbs, uh, absolutely. I would, I would argue, I agree with you. I would argue it actually started before the leak. Uh, was, was it intimidation when the uh, minority leader, then minority leader, currently the majority leader of the Senate, went on the Supreme Court steps and said, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, you will face the whirlwind. You're not going to know what hit you. Was that, was that an intimidation tactic? So it seems like when a Senate minority leader uh, stands on the steps of the Supreme Court and calls out two sitting justices by name, I believe that would be interpreted as a threat. When, when the Democrat chair of the Judiciary Committee introduced legislation 15 months ago to add four associate justices to the United States Supreme Court, was that an effort to intimidate the court? Absolutely. When the, the, the Judiciary Committee, and, and, and I, I just came from there, and just next door, we're having a markup as, as we speak. Um, did a concerted effort, had a hearing on Justice Thomas and, and, and talked about his wife. Was that an effort to intimidate the court? Yes, sir. And then you mentioned the leaked opinion, which was certainly, and you, you clerked on the Supreme Court, you have a distinguished uh, legal background. Uh, was that an effort to intimidate the court the first time that I know of or we had a draft opinion that was leaked? That, that's absolutely correct. It was the first time an opinion had ever been leaked. There were a few news reports trying to normalize that practice. That is untrue. A Supreme Court opinion has never leaked prior to it being ready to be issued. And as we saw, subsequent to that, 40 pregnancy care centers have been vandalized and targeted. In addition, Justice Kavanaugh had a murder attempt at his own home. Yeah, you, 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 you're ahead of me there. Uh, and I, I was going to point out, I, I only had 32 on my list. <laughs> this, is, this is frightening. 32 crisis pregnancy centers and churches since May 3rd, two months and one week, that has all happened. That is a concerted effort to go after pro-life people and intimidate a separate and equal branch of government with the support of these guys. That's how wrong this is. So the protest and the attacks that my colleague from Wisconsin talked about in Madison but have happened 39 other places around the country in two months and one week not to mention an assassination attempt, I think probably the first time in American history where we've had an assassination attempt on a sitting justice of the United States Supreme Court. Their whole focus is on intimidating the court, and they're the ones with the radical position. Mm -hmm. Mr. Raskin just said we're radical. They're the ones who think you should take the life of an unborn child. You could take the life of an unborn child right up until their birthday. Will the gentleman yield? Is that accurate, Ms. Hawley? Will my the gentleman yield? No, my question is for Ms. Hawley. Uh, absolutely, and I'd love to set the record straight on something uh, Congressman Raskin said. He said that the uh, American people support uh, the Women's Health Protection Act. They do not. Less than 10% of the American public uh, would support abortion up until birth for any reason. That law federalizes oh. a right to sex and race selective abortion. But it's even worse, Ms. Hawley. Hmm? It's even worse, because we know the former Democrat governor of Virginia didn't want it to go right up until their birthday. This is sickening. He wanted it to go after that. That is their position, not our position. We're the party that's pro-life. We actually think you should protect unborn children, not do what they want to do. And it's even worse though, this intimidation effort, because we now have, we had the Speaker of the House wait four weeks, four weeks after the Senate, Senate unanimously passed legislation to protect justices' families after the left had posted online, here's where Justice Barrett's children go to school. Here is where her family worships on Sunday morning. After posting that, after posting that, Speaker Pelosi says, nothing to worry about. We're going to wait four weeks until we protect Justice's family. And I would just finally add this in the last minute, and I'll let you respond. I think it's gotten even worse. We now have the key agency in the executive branch, 
the Justice Department, the Justice Department failing to enforce a statute which is directly on point, which says when there are protests at Justice's home with the intention of intimidating them and influencing a decision pending in front of the court, you're supposed to deal with that, and we have a Justice Department that refuses to do so, a Justice Department that is now working with the left to intimidate a separate and equal branch of government. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. And if we see sort of this, this reign of intimidation, it's not only Supreme Court justices and their families, as you mentioned, publishing online, where they go to church, uh, where their families, uh, including justices with young families, uh, reside. Uh, protesters at night uh, is never something you want your children to see. Um, in addition, we have got this just outrageous attack on pregnancy care centers. How we think this helps women in need is just beyond me. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, for your work on the, in, in the pro-life community and the work you do uh, representing uh, freedoms around the country. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if I may, I would like to submit for the record, I will submit an um, uh, article about the Secretary of State of Michigan being targeted and uh, for um, obviously uh, allowing the votes to be counted in Michigan, uh, literally in front of her home in the dark, as well as recently uplifting um, what has happened to a colleague, Representative Jayapal, uh, a man who basically wanted to commit a hate crime, uh, showed up at her home shouting, um, and, and, and with weapon, I believe, to kill our colleague. I just, I wanna reiterate the importance of Without making objection. sure that, Yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. It is important to understand this has been happening a long time for many of us, especially women of color in this, in this chamber. Republicans are claiming this is about returning power to the states, but they've said themselves that they want to ban abortion nationwide. Kevin McCarthy himself has, and Steve Scalise, as well as Mike Pence, has said it. In fact, every Republican in this committee, though, supports legislation that would lead to nationwide restrictions on abortion. And many of them support a bill to impose prison time on doctors who perform abortions after six weeks. So we need to set the record straight and don't let the rhetoric fool you. With that, I do want to go to uh, our Michigan Senator uh, McMorrow. You know, one of the things that has been impactful, Senator, is the fact that historically we've never seen anything like this. In the state of Michigan, we've collected over 800,000 signatures to allow to repeal the ban of the 1931 ban on abortion. Is that correct? That is correct. This is a constitutional amendment, the highest number of signatures collected for any initiative in state history. We will get the opportunity to allow our state to choose whether or not a woman gets the right to control her body. Is that correct? That is correct. And do you believe, though, that this chamber would, would try to attempt to overturn that state's right? I do, in both the state level and the federal level. So to paint a picture, Michigan in 2014, Democrats got about 51% of votes statewide. The state Senate in the chamber that I serve, Republicans held 72% of Senate seats. So this has led to an extremist view that is not in line with a majority of Michiganders. We know consistently when polled, 60 to 70% of Michiganders support Roe, support keeping protections in place. And we've seen that Herculean effort come out in this ballot initiative. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it, and I've worked on minimum wage, a number of other ballot initiatives, and I've never seen this kind of support. I'd like to take the rest of the time to do something that might be a little scary for my Republican colleagues, which is to ask a woman's opinion. Ms. Lopez, <laughs> thank you so much for being here with us today. What strike me listening to your story is just how many state-imposed hoops, a loophole, you know, all these obstacles that you had to jump through in order to carry out a personal decision about your own body and access to medical procedure. Can you describe more? I want you to take some time because I think people need to understand this is about human dignity and so much more. And so can you talk about, uh, you know, really how it made you feel, but also just, you know, the experiences. I think many folks that might not have the courage to be here because they're so scared of the attacks. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I can start by saying that Texas has dozens of restrictions, um, had dozens of restrictions already in place prior to Dobbs, prior to SB8. Um, and when I had my abortion six years ago, I had no context or you know knowledge of what a restriction was. Um, I didn't know that there was a forced waiting period that ended up pushing you know, me further into pregnancy another two weeks because I couldn't access care when I needed to. Um, 
as I mentioned in my testimony, the forced ultrasound um, felt horrible. I didn't understand why I was, you know, being asked to listen to, you know, embryonic cardiac activity when I knew I didn't want to be pregnant. Um, and perhaps one of the most confusing parts of my experience was my provider telling me that the state requires that he tell patients that abortion causes depression, infertility, and many other, and breast cancer. And then by following that up by saying, the state requires me to say that abortion is 100% safe, and many times it's safer than carrying a pregnancy to term. I didn't understand why a state was providing a um, doctor to spread misinformation to his patients, um, but I, you know, went through with it anyways, and despite the many restrictions that I faced, and again, as I mentioned in my testimony, I do feel lucky that I lived in a city that had a clinic that I was able to access care relatively smoothly, um, but what these restrictions are intended to do is try and make people, try and stop people from having abortions, but abortion is health care. Um, my abortion was the best decision I ever made. It was an act of self-love, and I'm here today to make sure that everybody who currently needs an abortion who has had an abortion or will need an abortion is not alone, no matter right. what the state tries to force upon us. Thank you General so much, Mr. Lopez, and I yield. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, just a, a couple things, uh, Mrs. Hawley. Um, uh, you clerked before Justice Roberts and argued cases before the Supreme Court, I, correct? I, uh, yes, sir. I clerked for Chief Justice Roberts and have litigated before the court, but not yes. argued. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, and our government is a constitutional republic. And the Tenth Amendment to our Constitution, as it says here, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. The Dobbs decision simply took abortion and said the states will determine the laws that cover that within those state borders, correct? That's correct. The Dobbs decision was actually one of judicial modesty. It corrected a 50-year error and returned to the people and the people's elected representatives the uh, intensely moral issue of abortion. Where it should be, and uh, that's asking a woman's opinion. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, following the Dobbs ruling, pro-life organizations, especially churches, have become scenes of vandalism and violence. On June 7th, the Department of Homeland Security issued a National Terrorism Advisory System bulletin warning faith-based institutions of expected threats of violence in the coming months. The FBI issued a safety report regarding Jane's Revenge, the same domestic terrorist organization responsible for pro posting flyers around D.C. that read, the night SCOTUS overturns Roe v. Wade, hit the streets. You said you'd riot to our oppressors. If abortions aren't safe, you're not either. Um, so we've had that happen. And since Dobbs' decision leaked on May 2nd, over 100 pro-life institutions have been recipients of threats, desecration, vandalism, and arson. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to submit a list for the record from Susan B. Anthony, Pro-Life America, outlining the recent violence. Without objection. So when we look at all the things that have happened, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, where's the outrage at the intimidation and coercion and violence for these? So I, I guess, M Ms. Hawley, what would leaders or what should leaders like President Biden and Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer, Schumer be doing to hold these perpetrators accountable for the violence uh, they're either threatening or causing around our nation? Well, violence against anyone, especially against pregnancy care centers, especially against sitting justices of the United States Supreme Court, should be appropriately punished. Uh, it should be deterred. It's illegal to protest with the intent of changing a judicial decision before a Supreme Court justice's home. Uh, that legislation should be passed to protect those judges and justices. Um, in addition, I, I just think we should see real moral outrage at the idea that we're targeting pregnancy care centers. These are the centers that come alongside women to support them, to provide them with tangible resources and counseling and medical care, all of it free. 
Um, and to think we would want to take this away from women who need it uh, is insane to me. Yeah, but when we're talking about helping women and the most vulnerable, which are the unborn uh, lives in our, in our society, I think that when we don't stand up for that, what other things will you not stand up for if you don't stand up for life? If, if, if a person isn't going to protect your life, do you think they're going to protect any of your other rights? No, and as, as we think about unborn babies, these are the tiniest and most vulnerable humans among us. Uh, they are most deserving of our protection, and it doesn't matter whether they're viable or, or need a little bit more help. They are fully human, they are fully alive, uh, and they deserve life. Being a father and a grandfather, I have three lovely granddaughters, and I will tell you right now that holding them for the first time there wasn't anybody that can convince me that wasn't a child or a life prior to birth. Absolutely. I also have three children and, and agree completely. So I thank you for being here today. I thank you for that opinion of a, of a great woman who has served so well for our nation. Thank you so much. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Rokana, is recognized for five minutes, and then we will recess, recess for votes. Mr. Rokana. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your leadership. The overturning of Roe versus Wade means that the state is literally requiring women to have forced pregnancies. And this is a matter of equality. It impacts a woman's education, economic opportunities, and securities. Ms. Gus Graves, how does legal abortion help ensure workforce participation for women and reduce the gender pay gap? So what we know is that if you look over time in the last five decades, there has been tremendous progress for women in particular. Their ability to control when and whether and the pacing of their pregnancies has meant that they could enter careers, that they could enter fields that they weren't present in before. And when we think about the other side and where we are now, what this is likely to mean for people is that not that they would have more children than they did before, it's just that they would have children when they didn't want them and at a time that didn't work for themselves and their families, it is likely to put more people into deep poverty and, and the vast majority, more than 60% of people who have abortion care, they're already parents. So it will affect them and their families deeply. Thank you, Ms. Goss Graves. It, it's so important that you emphasize that this is going to make the inequality, gender inequality, worse. And this is fundamentally an issue, not just of the right to make decisions, but also fundamental equality. It's why I think it's an issue under the 14th Amendment. Let me turn to you, Ms. Lopez. Uh, why is access to abortion so important for young people who still are in school or just about to enter the workforce? Thank you. Um, I, I would first like to state that young people have just as much of a right as anyone else to exercise bodily autonomy, but it is especially important that young people have that autonomy in order to create the lives for themselves to thrive and do and create the families they want on their own terms, um, and that they are not being forced into pregnancy by any government or by any you know other entity, that they're able to make these decisions themselves. Um, and that decision also includes if they decide to continue a pregnancy. All of these, all pregnancy outcomes should be decided by the pregnant person, and the laws should reflect the health and safety of pregnant people. Um, and I would also just like to state on the record that um, young people, you know, patients also face harassment. Um, providers face harassment every single day for providing health care. And so young people d deserve to, you know, access abortion care and all sexual and reproductive health care free from state intervention or stigma. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Senator McMorrow, thank you. I've, I recommend your four-minute speech to everyone. I'm sure millions of people have already seen it, but I was very moved by that. If you could take just 30 seconds, because I've got two questions uh, left, but could you speak to the legal abortion benefits uh, for mothers in the United States? Absolutely. As I said in my opening testimony, Congressman, getting and staying pregnant 
is incredibly difficult. So I can tell you just some of the reaction immediately once the Dobbs decision came down. There was a group of, of uh, local residents on Facebook who created a Google document of OBGYNs who will tie your tubes, no questions asked. The ability to ensure that abortion access is safe and secure means that women and families can pursue pregnancy knowing that if it doesn't go perfectly, that they will be okay. Thank you so much, Senator McMorrow, and appreciate all your advocacy. My final question, uh, Ms. Hawley, I, I read your piece actually on Edmund Burke and uh, stare decisis. I disagreed with it, but was well argued in terms of Burke's position. I wonder if there is uh, any possible common ground. Surely you would agree with me that in this country uh, we should never prosecute criminally women if they choose to get an abortion. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Women should never be prosecuted. Thank you. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Votes have been called to accommodate members voting. The com committee is going to take a short recess. Uh, and we will reconvene 10 minutes following the beginning of the last vote in the series. The committee stands in recess.
The committee will come to order. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for staying around and uh, working with us on our vote schedule today. Our, our Declaration of Independence was unique in that it introduced into the world a profound set of ideals to be perfected in subsequent generations. And, and that was that there were certain inalienable rights that were given to mankind. And they weren't a grant from government, but they were a gift from God. And the Declaration of Independence went on to state that these, among these were life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And it is notable that those, those ideals upon which the rest of the rule of law under which we live is all based on that first essential right, and that is the right to life. With the Dobbs decision, in a single day, millions gained that right that had been taken away previously. And uh, if we look at the development of, of science over the last 50 years, you know, I was born in 75, just a couple years after Roe, and ultrasounds are very rare. I asked my mom for my ultrasound, and there was not one to be found. Uh, there, there isn't one uh, because of that. And when Roe was being argued, even, the, the dialogue at the time was that it was a blob of tissue that was in development. Uh, in, and we know so much more now than we did before. And um, we know that a, a child at six weeks we can even detect a heartbeat. We, we know that science is even showing us that a child can feel the pain of an ab abortion. And so there's a lot of misinformation that's happened uh, since the Dobbs information that I thought we would need to address. As, and as a matter of fact, the chair said that the Dobbs decision was, uh, and I, I quote, undemocratic uh, in the sense of could you speak to Ms. Hawley, the Dobbs decision, and if it's undemocratic or not? Certainly, Congressman Cloud. So the Dobbs decision is not anti-democratic. It is an act of judicial modesty. It's a decision in which the majority clearly explains that the Constitution's text, structure, and history are absolutely silent on a right to an abortion. And as Justice Alito explains, that means that we, the people, get to debate this issue, to decide this issue, and the Supreme Court got out of the business of legislating abortion. So if anything, it restored a democratic process to the discussion of abortion. Absolutely. Justice Alito's opinion leaves it to the people. That, that's my understanding as well. It was also said that this was pro-life people who embrace this are extremist, uh, draconian, uh, is how this decision was. Uh, we've heard about its threats, democracy, and all those sorts of things. Um, when we talk about extremism and dr draconian, can you compare where the United States stands in relation to other countries when it comes to abortion? Absolutely. So under Roe versus Wade, the United States was one of the most extreme and most permissible, permissive nations on abortion in the entire world. We were one of only seven countries in the world, including countries like China and North Korea, who have horrible human rights records, uh, to allow abortion up until the moment of birth, for any reason at all. So that's so very rare. We're not on the right side of that. Uh, so. Um, are there any state laws that would prosecute women for an abortion? There are not, no. There, there are no state abortion laws, no, that would prosecute women for abortion. Any federal? No. Because we've heard that a, a lot about that. Could you speak to atopic pregnancies and, and abortion? Because we keep hearing that that's an issue as well. Thank you so much for that question. I think ectopic pregnancies are an issue of, as you said, misinformation. There have been social media posts suggesting that women won't get treated for an ectopic pregnancy because doctors might be afraid of performing the procedure, but that's absolutely false. An ectopic pregnancy uh, treatment for an ectopic pregnancy is not, in fact, an abortion. An abortion is the intentional taking of a human life. An ectopic pregnancy is a tragic situation uh, in which the baby is developing outside of the womb, and treatment for that, as Planned Parenthood has recognized, is simply not an abortion. Now, you spoke to what is the norms in the world. Um, both you and I, I think, uh, believe that, that 
life begins at conception, and this is a question of life, you know, ultimately, and, and that's what makes it so difficult and, and why this is such a, uh, the views are so deep-seated uh, when it comes to this. But uh, when it comes to what's normal, the Democrats have proposed two bills that we'll be voting on Friday, uh, eight, H.R. Uh, 8296 and H2, uh, H.R. 8297. And these bills would, among other things, uh, allow for abortion because of disability, uh, what sex the child is, what race the child is potentially. Uh, there's provisions in it to serve as an end around parents being involved in their child's life. Uh, there's ambiguous language that could potentially force pro-life doctors, um, many who their faith would dictate to them that this is uh, not a proper thing to do to perform an abortion. And what's troubling to me is also we've gone from the left from wanting it to be rare, mm -hmm. uh, supposedly, to now we want taxpayers to fund it, not only in our country to pay for other people's abortions, but also for abortions overseas. This yeah, is gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Thank you for your statement today. Thank you for being here. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Porter, is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record findings from the turnaway study of women who sought abortions. Without objection. Before Dobbs, even under Roe, Americans who wanted an abortion were denied. The turnaway study examined the lives of hundreds of people who were denied abortion and compared their experiences to people who got abortions. Ms. Gosgraves, are you familiar with the turnaway study? Yes, I am. I want to use my whiteboard to help Americans understand what this study found. Let's start with health. Rich women were more likely to suffer from physical health problems, women who had an abortion or women who were denied an abortion? Women who were denied an abortion. Women who were denied an abortion. And rich women were, um, Denying abortion does not just correlate with worse physical health, it also leads to financial problems. Which group of women, those who received an abortion or were denied an abortion, were more likely to be unemployed? For sure, those who were denied an abortion. Denied an abortion. Which group of women was more likely to live in poverty? Definitely those who were denied abortion. And which group of women was more likely to have low credit scores, to have their applications for housing or car loans denied? those who were denied an abortion. So to summarize, women, when the decision to have an abortion was not, was taken out of their hands, when they were not able to have an abortion, to make their own decision, they had worse health outcomes, were more likely to be unemployed, were more likely to face financial problems like pot living in poverty or having low credit scores, Women who were denied abortions are four times more likely to live below the poverty line. They are less likely to be able to afford food and housing for themselves and their children. Ms. Gosgraves, can you explain why people who are denied abortion are more likely to have these worse outcomes than someone who obtains an abortion? If you're denied an abortion, you're not having a child based on when you actually want to. And what we know is that there's a wide range of reasons people determine that it is not the right time to have a child. It could be that their health is not the reason that they want to have a child at that time. But it also could be because they're not financially secure, it, they're in a relationship where it, it does not make sense. There are a range of reasons. That's why it's so important that that decision be the decision of the person who is actually pregnant, the person who is actually going to have that child, that whether or not they do that. Ms. Cosgraves, I completely agree. We should let people who are pregnant make the decision whether or not to carry that child, to deliver that child, and to raise that child. I'm a mom. I love my three children. I know firsthand the joys and hardships of caring, birthing, raising, and providing for children, including doing it alone, as millions of women do. That's why I believe so strongly that extremist politicians shouldn't have the power to force anyone to become a parent. 
The choice to give birth is not just a major health decision. It's an economic decision for an entire family, including other children that that person, that mother or parent may have. Many women experience a significant decrease in their incomes after having a child, and income declines even further after the birth of additional children. Many parents are forced to leave the workforce altogether to care for their kids. When extremist politicians prevent Americans from making their own decisions, they force patients to give birth to children that they may not be able to care for, that they may not be able to protect and raise safely, and that they may force to grow up in poverty. We live, we should live, in a free society. Americans should have the freedom, the liberty, to grow their families when they are ready to do so, not birth babies because of government mandates. I am here at home, sick with COVID and caring for my two children alone. I do not need, and American women do not need, any politicians telling them when and if they should make the decisions to raise children. I thank you, Ms. Gosh Grace, for your testimony and everybody on this panel, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, I thank the chair, Chairwoman. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here today in this incredibly um, politically charged hearing. I know we get to have another one tomorrow. In fact, the Democrats are calling five for five hearings in, in, in five days, effectively, on this topic. Uh, Democrats really are the abortion extremists relying on a strategy of fear. That's really what it is. I associate myself with the video that was put in there, and I will say one thing. When Mr. Jordan was asking questions, he forgot to ask the questions about bounties put up by shutdown D.C. on Supreme Court justices. That is absolutely outrageous, and I haven't heard any of my colleagues across the aisle, not one, say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do that. Stop doing that. It is an incredible, incredible uh, strategy of fear that they're perpetuating. Um, Governor Northam, and, it's, and they're extremists, Governor Northam said that third trimester abortions are done in cases where there may be severe deformities, there may be a fetus that's non-viable. So in this particular example, if a mother is in labor, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired, and then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother about the outcome for that baby. I associate my myself with the comments of Senator Rubio, who said that he never thought he would see the day in America where America had government officials who openly support legal infanticide. Elizabeth Warren, what did she say? She said, in Massachusetts right now, crisis pregnancy sitters there are fooling people who are looking for pregnancy termination. They help outnumber true abortion clinics by three to one. We need to shut them down in Massachusetts. We need to shut them down all around the country. Wow, that's from the, from the, the liberal left. I'll ask a question now of Ms. Holly. Um, Ms. Holly, did the Dobbs decision shut down abortions completely nationwide? The Dobbs decision returned to the states the authority finally to be able to protect life. In 1973, a majority of men on the Supreme Court declared that no matter how compelling a state's interest was in protecting life, no matter what we learned about a baby's development, states could not protect that life until 22 weeks. With the Dobbs decision, a decision of judicial modesty, the people and their elected representatives get to make that choice. And I'm looking now uh, about an, a recent article in the New York Times. When it comes to abortion rights, Democrats need to lean into the politics of fear. The party needs to scare voters and show that they too are scared, uh, scared of the voters themselves. That is the politics of fear that happens here. And let's just think for, for a second, gestational limits on abortion in the United States compared to international norms. I've got a series of articles on that, and I'm going to go through these really quickly because this time goes by fast. I want to give you some European countries. Uh, Austria, limits for the, to the first three months, and the rest of these are in weeks. Belgium, 12. Bulgaria, 12. Croatia, 10. Cyprus, 12. Czech Republic, 12. Denmark, 12. Estonia, 11. Latvia, 12. Italy, 12. Hungary, 12. Greece, 12. France, 14. You know what? 
America's laws pre-Dobbs were some of the most radical on this planet, right up until the birth, exit of the birth canal. And what's happened since then? The left is okie-dokie with uh, this strategy of fear and violence. Ohio Right to Life says offices targeted twice by pro-abortion activists. Democrats have launched ads in lifestyle mags. Summer of rage. Uh, I, I appreciate that some have said 32 or some 40. I have one dated June 9th, 56 attacks, mm -hmm. including one in Beth Bethesda over the weekend. Attacks on church, churches, pro-life pregnancy centers continue. This one's in Hutchinson, Kansas. The next one, I might, next one I'll submit is from Bullhead City in my state. The Justice Department has announced that it's gonna, it has a reproductive rights task force. And the threat from the left is that abortion bans could lose economic edge. That's what the New York Times reports. Nothing's further from the truth. This is a strategy of fear. It's a strategy of threats and intimidation against members of the Supreme Court. It's a, a, a clinic on disinformation by asserting that, that uh, it, this law prevents abortion throughout the country. Uh, last question for you, Ms. Hawley. Can men become pregnant? Biological women may become pregnant. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Bush, is now recognized. St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, for convening this urgent, urgent hearing. Within minutes of the far-right Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe and Casey, my home state of Missouri was the first state to enact its trigger law and ban abortion care. And despite the wrong information provided by my colleagues on the other side, there are state laws that prosecute people for performing their own abortions, which um, includes trans men. So trans men, more than women, trans men and non-binary people do become pregnant. The criminalization of abortion care has a ripple effect across the healthcare and criminal legal systems. The majority of states where abortion care is now banned have threatened to enforce criminal laws that target healthcare providers for administering medication and providing abortion care to those who need it. In Missouri, any provider suspected of inducing an abortion could face felony charges and if convicted, a sentence of, of up to 15 years. In other states like Texas, the penalty includes the possibility of a life sentence. I've heard from people in St. Louis who tell me that they are afraid to cross the state lines to access abortion care, which they need because they fear being investigated and prosecuted at home. Though many of these laws exempt pregnant people, we know that pregnant outcomes have long been politicized, which is happening in this moment and criminalized. People have been investigated and punished for experiencing pregnancy loss, for struggling with substance use during pregnancy or self-managing abortion care. In states where abortion care is banned and in states where abortion care is legal and, and protected. A local prosecutor in California charged two women with murder because of their pregnancy loss. I am concerned that far-right extremist anti-abortion lawmakers in my own state, like our state attorney general, may move to further politicize our rights and criminalize abortion care and pregnancy outcomes. Unless we speak up more, unless we act and act uh, and push harder, and until we organize to block extremist anti-human rights laws and protect, fully protect reproductive freedom. So Representative Shannon, can you please describe what measures are being taken to protect people from being criminalized for seeking abortion care in Georgia? Um, it's a red state like mine. Thank you for the question and thank you for your work on this issue. Um, yes, we've had DAs in Georgia as well as um, local municipalities come out and say that they will not use government funds to prosecute folks for or to investigate folks for having had an abortion should Georgia's um, 481 law go into effect, which would effectively outlaw abortion. And so I'm glad that you mentioned um, about what is going on with criminalization because we also at the same time have DAs across the country who are hyper aggressive about finding ways, bending and twisting the law, using other laws to actually criminalize folks. And we do know that there has been an, an uptick of um, criminalization of miscarriages across the country. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for those insights and thank you for what you do. Ms. Goss Graves, can you please explain how the criminalization of abortion creates a public health emergency? So abortion care is both effective and safe. What is really, really deeply concerning is if people are either afraid to seek medical care if they need it, or if providers are chilled, if they are afraid to provide medical care, not knowing the state of the law. So it is those things that stand to worsen the health of someone who is seeking abortion care. And the other thing that we know is that carrying a pregnancy to term and childbirth is inherently risky, especially for black women. The maternal mortality rates are extremely high. So none of these laws will do anything to aid that and will only worsen those outcomes. Thank you for that clarity, we appreciate that. As our witnesses have extensively described, the impact of this devastating Supreme Court ruling will fall hardest on black, brown and indigenous communities people with disabilities, undocumented people, queer and trans folks, youth and the most marginalized members of our society. Federal legislators have an obligation, all of us who chose, who signed up for the full, to take care of the full, to serve, to represent the full, uh, whether it's uh, regardless of what you look like, where you come from, how much money you have, we signed up to work for everyone. To work to, we need to work in lockstep with our state and local counterparts to protect access to reproductive health care for everyone, regardless of where they live. Thank the you. Gen the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. Um, the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. LaTurner. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. The Supreme Court decision in Dobbs versus Jackson, women's health was a monumental one. It signifies a victory for pro-life Americans across this country, but most importantly, the innocent unborn. But make no mistake, the Dobbs ruling is not just a victory for the pro-life movement, but it's a victory for our Constitution and for the principle of federalism. If you want to have abortion laws in this country uh, to your liking, elect officials that agree with you and pass it in the legislative body in states throughout this country. That is the way to achieve it, but let's not pretend that the right to abortion existed in our Constitution in this country. And contrary to what some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle say, this decision in no way endangers life-saving medical care for pregnant mothers. In fact, Mississippi statute in question explicitly excludes procedures to treat ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages from the definition of abortion. And there are nearly identical exceptions in every state that has enacted pro-life laws. This protection of both unborn children and their mothers is what a consistent and compassionate ethic of life looks like. In my home state of Kansas, citizens will have the opportunity this August to vote for the Value Them Both constitutional amendment, which rightly reserves the right to pass laws regulating abortion to the people through their elected representatives. I am a firm supporter of this change and hope that the momentum from the historic Dobbs decision compels Kansans to restore authority to citizens to decide abortion laws. I celebrate the impact of the Supreme Court's decision and its implication for the sanctity of human life, both for mothers and their unborn children. Ms. Hawley, thank you for being here today. In your opinion, why is the regulation of abortion better suited for state legislatures than the unelected Supreme Court or even us here in Congress? Well, the state legislatures uh, are very close to the people. Um, I think Justice Alito's opinion laid out that 55% of the voters in Mississippi are women. And so those voters in Mississippi now have a voice uh, and a vote. Uh, they are able to tackle these really difficult issues. Um, and we can allow women to express their opinions on this issue. There's been a lot of conversation among my colleagues on social media and by pro-abortion organizations that warn women that their government is tracking their activity across health apps and their search history on web browsers and will use that information to seek criminal penalties related to abortion. Do any of the road trigger laws include criminal enforcement mechanisms against women who seek abortions? No, they do not. What would you say to women who are scared that they will face criminal penalties for miscarriages, pregnancy loss, or ectopic pregnancies? Because as you know, this is a real issue and real anxiety, uh, even among those that, uh, that consider themselves uh, pro-life but want exceptions. 
um, there is a lot of fear mongering going on out there, and I'd like you to address it. Absolutely. Well, as you mentioned, Congressman, every state's law has an exception for life of the mother. And this means that doctors and physicians will be able to treat the mother uh, when her life's in danger. Similarly, the idea that treatment for an ectopic pregnancy is an abortion is simply false. That is scaremongering. It is untrue. Uh, it's a tragedy that actually one in 50 pregnancies are ectopic pregnancies. Women usually find out about this between six and eight weeks, and it's a horrible circumstance. But but treatment for that is not an abortion. There's no intent to take the child's life. There's no reason to be worried, uh, either as a doctor and physician or especially as a woman. And what do you think damage is caused by this fear mongering? So, so I think, you know, discovering you are pregnant, uh, whether it's something you've longed and hoped for uh, or something that's unexpected, uh, can be overwhelming. Um, and to have this additional fear-mongering on top of that, I think, just adds uh, to that uncertainty of women. Uh, we need to come alongside women and support them. We need to provide them with the resources that are necessary for them and their children to survive. Uh, the Dobbs decision is not only a legal victory, but it is a rallying cry. We must become a culture that values life, that values women's lives, and provides them with the resources they need throughout their pregnancy and beyond. And if I could get you to comment uh, on this, it was referenced earlier, the vandalism that is being done throughout this country and the intimidation that is being attempted. In my home state of Kansas, as I mentioned, the, it, we're, we're trying to pass value them both because mm -hmm. our state Supreme Court uh, uh, wrongly decided that our 1859 Constitution had a right to an abortion in it. Uh, which is absolutely absurd. But we're trying to write that, and we have instances in Kansas right now where churches are being vandalized. Would you comment on that briefly? Absolutely. Well, I think you're right that the Roe versus Wade decision not only misled the American people by imposing a, a constitutional right to abortion, but also state Supreme Courts. So uh, hopefully Kansas can rectify that. Um, as far as the vandalism the, the, the uh, goes to... The lady's time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. The gentlewoman from Ohio... No, no. It's the gentlewoman from California. Ms. Jackie Spear is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, thank you so much for holding this hearing. Let me say at the outset um, to my good friend, Mr. Jordan, um, to others on the Republican side, yes, we deplore violence against crisis pregnancy centers. We deplore violence against justices and judges. We deplore violence against the institution we call the U.S. Capitol. We also deplore violence against abortion clinics. And you have said nothing about the fact that 11 people have been murdered at those clinics. Four doctors, two clinic employees, one security guard, one police officer, and one clinic escort. Last year, there were 186 arson targeted at abortion centers. There were 123 acts of vandalism, 123 incidents of assault and battery. Stalking increased by 600% last year um, over 2020. Invasions of abortion facilities increased by 129%. Assault and batteries increased by 128% and suspicious packages by 163%. I did not hear one word from any of you deploring and denouncing those acts of violence. So you have very selective memories. Let me start, Madam Chair, by speaking about mothers. I'm a mother. I'm a mother who had an abortion. 59% of women in this country who have abortions are mothers. They love their children. They want to provide for their children. Across this country, women are asking themselves, is it even safe to get pregnant? This is not hyperbolic. As states criminalize abortion, they're also making it illegal to treat many pregnancy-related complications. I've had two miscarriages. Miscarriages happen a lot. One in five pregnancies. It is often indistinguishable from an induced abortion. It is the same procedure, a D and C or a D and E. And the treatment for miscarriage is the same as the treatment to induce medical abortion. If a miscarriage doesn't progress naturally, which could take up to three or four weeks, a woman may need medication abortion or a D and C, especially if there's signs of infection. When I had my first miscarriage, I was told I was going to have to wait 
a period of days before they could give me a DNC. I can't begin to tell you what it's like having wanted that fetus to become a baby and know that it was dead in my body and I had to walk around with that. I had a mother at a church once say to me, I had to carry a dead fetus to term for nine months. We are now living in a country where women will be denied miscarriage treatment because doctors will rightly worry about whether or not they're gonna be thrown in jail for 99 years. The same goes for providers treating women who are seriously ill. If a woman has a 50% chance of dying, is that sufficient to provide an abortion? How about 20% or 10%? At what point do we value the life of the woman? Ms. Goss Graves, how will criminalizing abortion impact patients who are experiencing miscarriage or other pregnancy-related complications? You know, we are already hearing reports on the ground from providers being uncertain about the care that they can actually provide when faced with someone who has uh, an ectopic pregnancy. And I, to go back to the point that you raised around miscarriage, what is likely to happen is an acceleration in miscarriages being investigated. And that might not be everyone's experience, but I am telling you it will be the experience of people who are more likely to be low income and black and brown people. You know, this is, this is a population that already has too much unfair contact with the criminal justice system. And so what we will see is going through a miscarriage loss turning into a criminal event. Nothing about that helps the life or health of the person who is pregnant, and all of it shows the actual safe and effective effective care people need. Thank you. Um, and it, we're not talking just about miscarriages. Senator McMorrow, you've spoken about needing a DNC after your IUD punctured your uterus. Can you tell us about your experience and what it would have meant for you if abortion had been illegal? Yes, uh, after having my daughter, I had an IUD placed and that IUD ruptured through my uterus. It's a very rare instance that required me scheduled for a laparoscopy and a DNC to have it removed. The impact is that I could have died if I had not been able to have the procedure to have that removed. And we're already hearing from the University of Michigan Medicine um, saying that they the, fear the training. The gentlelady's time doctor. has expired. Very moving though. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Clyde, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. As we all know, we are here today because of the life-saving decision that the Supreme Court made on June the 22nd in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Care Organization case. This historic decision simply restored the rights of voters in each state to allow voting citizens to have a say in protecting life. I would like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record, this article that states that 71% of Americans support limits on abortion. It is a Fox News article dated January 20th, 2022. Without objection. Thank you. The impact of the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs will now let the American people decide on the issue of abortion. American voters are able to elect representatives that they believe best represent their beliefs, and I believe they will do exactly that. But Democrats have brought us here today to talk about the impact of the Dobbs decision. But the impact is exactly what I just said. So we should do away with this hearing and change the focus to things that citizens really care about, like rising inflation, rising crime, and open borders that are putting the safety and security of our families at risk all across the country in every state. Let, re let me remind you again of the impact of Dobbs. It allows American voters to have a say on abortion. That's all it does. And that's why Democrats are terrified, and that is why we are here today, which leads me to my first question. Ms. Hawley, Democrats seem to think it's a bad thing to let American voters have a say on abortion, as opposed to having the courts say it. Um, if Americans wanted to legalize abortion, wouldn't they simply vote for a majority of candidates into office that would do that? I mean, is, is, is it a bad thing to return it to the states? Um, it's not a federal issue, right? Well, I think we can see the extremeness of the Democratic pro-abortion position when we look at the Women's Health Protection Act. 
So if we look at that act, it permits abortion up until the moment of birth for any reason. This is a more extreme policy than all but seven countries in the world, including China and North Korea, countries that have horrendous um, human rights records. Uh, in addition, it allows abortions for, for any reason, including sex, uh, including race. Uh, it supersedes every single state law. So common sense provisions that might require parental notification or that, that might say there are some safety and health regulations that apply to abortions, those two are gone under this nationally mandated abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy bill. Thank you. So uh, I think it's much better that it goes back to the states for the people to decide. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Graves, uh, you are the president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. Um, is the word abortion, I mean, so you're a lawyer, obviously, a, a, probably a very good one. I hope so. Uh, I, would, I would hope so, too. Is the word abortion anywhere in the Constitution? Well, there's lots of words that aren't actually in the Constitution. I, I, I just asked a question, protected. and I just need a yes or no answer, please. Is the word abortion anywhere in the Constitution? The word abortion is not in the Constitution. It is not. Thank you very much. Okay. Earlier this year, our newest Supreme Court Justice, uh, Katandra Brown Jackson, was asked what a woman is, and she had a difficult time defining that. Since you are the president of the National Women's Law Center, I was hoping that you could define what a woman is for us in this committee hearing. Well, as the president of the National Women's Law Center, you can imagine I say woman a lot. Uh, in my day job. Okay, uh, so I'm just uh, asking I, for the de definition. I'm, so, and, and so what I'll tell you is I am a woman, that's how I identify. Okay. But I wonder, however, if in part the reason that you're asking a question is that you're trying to suggest that people who I am don't simply asking the question and I simply want an it. answer. I, and so I, I think it's actually really important to be very clear here that there are people who identify as non-binary. I think okay. about All five right. percent we're, we're, of young. We're not going to go there. I was hoping maybe you would. I was hoping that you, maybe you would say something that maybe we learned in um, high school biology that has to do with X and Y chromosomes, but uh, which define male and female. But I guess we're not going to get there. Well, I don't, um, I don't so think that's the legal question. I, I have another question a lawyer, for you. And I, think I have another question a for you. One. I saw that in your annual report, you previously received money from groups like Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Are you still receiving funding from Planned Parent Action Fund or any other Planned Parenthood affiliate? Well, I certainly support the leadership and work of Planned Parenthood. The work they're doing right now is hero work. We don't have any uh, grants from Are you from receiving Planned money from them or not? We don't have grants from Planned Parenthood. But I support the work they do, the work they do around okay. this country every Madam day. Madam Chair, I would ask for unanimous consent to submit for the record the annual report of the NWLC, um, which states uh, a contribution from Planned Parent Action Fund. Without objection, and the gentleman's time has expired. I, I thought the I had The gentlewoman 16 from Illinois, Ms. Kelly, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Even before the Dobbs ruling, the United States was faithful price with the highest maternal mortality rate that equally fell. More than seven women died from and well, we're having trouble with the connection, uh, Representative. Mm. I think can we can you not hear now we can hear you better. Okay. Okay. Um, Today, as we know, black women are three to four times more likely than white women to experience fatal pregnancy complications. Ms. Goss Graves, can you speak to why black women are more likely to die during pregnancy? And how will Dobbs make this, this even worse? Well, so one of the reasons why the maternal mortality rate is higher for black women is that they have less health access to health care more broadly. They're less likely to have access to insurance. But one of the other things that we know is that the discrimination and bias that they receive in healthcare makes the pregnancies that black women have even more serious. So when they raise concerns about their health, they're not always taken as seriously. And I, and I commend the work that this Congress has done to try to deal with the maternal mortality uh, crisis in this country. I have such deep, deep worries that we will be accelerating on the wrong track, especially in states that have ran to ban abortion um, 
leaving people without options to decide whether they want to have children themselves. And um, we should be especially alarmed and concerned uh, that the states with the highest rates of maternal mortality, have, as you have alluded to, have also banned or are about to ban abortion, and more women will die as a result. Representative Shannon, Georgia has one of the worst mortality, maternal mortality crisis in the country. Are the anti choice politicians who advocate for forced pregnancy taking maternal mortality crisis in your Could you repeat? Could you repeat the question? It cut out. I'm sorry. The anti choice politicians who advocate for forced pregnancy are they taking any steps to address the mortality crisis in your state? You know, some of these folks, once pressured and uh, being told that they were not living their values of wanting to make sure that um, everyone has access to health care, which, which is what they claim, they did support the effort that I led to expand postpartum Medicaid. But one thing I'd like to uh, correct on the record, because I've heard this many times, the disinformation of how the United States is radical compared to other countries, most countries don't legislate abortion. They don't. You know why? Because they know that abortion is health care. So this is not even something that's even legislated in most countries. So that's why you don't see um, that, you know, this is something that's regularly talked about because they know that this is not a political issue. And it was not a political issue until the 1980s when Republicans used it to coalesce their base. So all the talk about how radical the U.S. was in protecting abortion rights is just completely false. Well, thank you for clearing that up. Uh, maternal mortality rates of black women increased uh, during the pandemic, and I'm alarmed and enraged that abortion make that disparity worse. Maternal mortality is a public health and we need to address it address it as and not forcing to carry pregnancy, not solving this problem. I just want to say on the record that my constituents and other back to Illinois care about this issue. Yes care about inflation, but they care very and their rights and their privacy. I yield. The gentlelady yields back, and the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Norman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I find it amazing that the statement, uh, abortion is health care, that, that, that's, that's totally unbelievable that you're uttering abortion is health care. Is it health care for the child? Is it health care for that person? Um, to, to make that statement is, is uh, completely, uh, it baffles me. Let me ask the three of you, and I think I know Ms. Hawley's position, but uh, starting with Ms. Lopez, I assume you agree with infanticide, the killing of a child, a perfectly healthy child at birth? I don't accept the basis of that question, but Pardon? I do believe abortion is health care. I'm talking about, do you agree? I, I know, I get that, but do you agree? I mean, are you in, do you support infanticide, killing a child after he's born? I do not agree with the basis of that question. What's but the I basis? do believe that abortion is health care. Okay, so I'll take that as a yes, you do agree with infanticide. Ms. Shannon, do you agree with infanticide? Well, I think you're using um, inflammatory language to basically describe a situation that does not happen. We don't have infanticide happening. Doctors would not do that, and neither would folks who have carried pregnancy. Okay, would a healthy child, do you agree if a healthy child is born, that is that woman's right to decide if it lives or dies? What I think is, based on your question, you have a very low opinion of pregnant people. Because if you think no, no, that anybody the, would answer carry... Answer the question. Excuse me. Excuse, answer the question. I'm answering it. Do you no, wanna, you're not. You want to answer take it or you, you want to keep talking over witnesses? What I'm telling no, no. you is nobody would carry a pregnancy and then decide on a Monday because they are bored that they want to have an abortion. That's ridiculous. And it's inflammatory, you're, what you're saying. You're talking about families who are in tough situations where folks have been excited about carrying a pregnancy. Most of the abortions that happen later in pregnancy are really tragedies where it's really a disappointment for everyone involved. But you agree with, I, t I take it with all those words, uh, you do agree with basically murdering a child at, uh, after they're born. Ms. Uh, Ms. Graves, could you answer that? Would you just, yes or no? I have to say, Congressman, how you just characterize the representative statement is, is extremely inflammatory and the type of thing that it's dangerous. And what you she's guys saying have been talking today about the threats against crisis pregnancy centers, which 
I assume are are serious and are terrible. The threats I've that got people a who work on abortion I'm not letting you access reclaiming my time. Day, I'm assuming that you're part for of it is infanticide. Because of this sort I would of also say that her, and line, her language, language that health is Madam Chair, not okay. That, uh, the gentleman's time. Congressman, that's the question. He's reclaiming his time. I would say this: it's inflammatory when she says health care. Yeah, abortion the, is health. I'm not hold on. I'm not giving. I'm not. I'm not sharing the. I'm reclaiming my time. Now, this being said, do the three of y'all favor doing away with the laws that's on the books? If a mother is carrying a child and is ki shot, is that murder? Is that homicide? Or should that be abolished too? I don't even what law. Homicide for if who? Homo, if if a mother is carrying a child and gets murdered, that they're charged now in most every state that I know of, double homicide. They kill the mother and they kill the child. Is that right? Do you favor that or do you want to abolish that? Well, I'll go first. I'm glad you brought no, that I'm, up. I'm asking Ms. Ms. Okay. Grace first. I have no She's idea. She's a lawyer. What lo I am, and I used to think I was a good one, but I, I, have, I have no idea what law you're talking about. But what I what do I you know. Do you understand that if a I, mother is carrying a child and get shot. It happened in my, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where a mother and was so carrying a child. Hold on, a mother and was carrying a child when she was ki killed. Uh, she was charged with double homicide, killing two people. Should that be abolished or not? One of the most dangerous times is being You're not pregnant, going and that is in part not because the of question. the sort of violence Look, that pregnant uh, people I've got 53 seconds. Experience. Let me just say the Dobbs decision was the greatest decision this Supreme Court has made. It's federalism, federalism versus states' rights. The, the untruths that y'all are putting out there, the left is putting out about doing away with abortion, the states decided. And, and all this other, abortion. all this other uh, things that you're putting out, state abortion restrictions would not allow would not allow a physician to care for a woman if uh, if it poses a serious threat to her life. Totally false. State abortion restrictions mean a woman with an ectopic pregnancy must choose between jail or death. That is totally absurd. And you know, I just the the Supreme Court got it right. Uh, I hope each state will ban abortions, infanticide, which the three of you are in agreement with. I, I object to that. I, I am not a, in agreement with him. And, and I object and to I the want fact to, that you didn't I, I answer. Sorry, none of you answered dangerous. the question. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I find it ironic that my colleagues on the other side keep talking about giving the states the right to choose about abortion. But you want to take that right to choose away from a woman who is carrying that child, who has all of the responsibilities, health care, and all of that. I find that ironic that choice only works for you in certain scenarios. I will continue my comments that when you talk about the fact health care, obviously you're a man, you are totally clueless or you don't give a darn, that when a woman is pregnant, that is a health unique situation that requires uh, interventions, it requires special treatment. That's why doctors obviously specialize in care for pregnant women. It is a health care issue. My question goes to Senator Mario. We know that state officials, as we keep hearing about the choice, the choice going to the states, like yourself, a majority of people in the states like Michigan push back against the effort to take, a, take our constituents back in time. My question is, what are we doing and what can states do? Because this conversation about just the mere fact that having the ability to have health care during a pregnancy to make a choice is not health care shows that we're dealing with a, a population that we cannot educate. Please comment on that. Thank Senator. you, Congressman. And, and first of all, I am so grateful to hear from our Republican federal colleagues that they plan to pass legislation prohibiting partisan gerrymandering. Because if we are returning 
this issue to the states and state legislatures. We must ensure that people have a fair right to elect their choice of elected officials that represent their values, because right now in Michigan and courts have ruled as such, that is not the case. We are one of the most badly gerrymandered states in the country, and all you have to look at is the effort behind the ballot initiative, the number of people, volunteers who have stood up, who have collected signatures to challenge the vocal extreme minority that are passing legislation against the will of the majority. So we need the federal government, our colleagues in Congress, to ensure that on the local level, every single voter is able to elect their candidate of choice that aligns with their values. Thank you. I want to ask a similar question to Representative Shannon. I understand that Georgia previously passed a six week um, abortion ban. Now, what steps are officials in your state taking to help ensure that Georgian residents are able to access abortion care if the six week ban goes into effort, in effect, I'm sorry. So DAs um, across the state are saying that they will not use funds nor prosecute folks for um, getting access to health care, which is abortion. And uh, local municipalities are also saying that they will not allow um, funds to be used to track folks or um, stop anybody from getting access to care. Thank you. I want to use the remaining of my time. As a woman, when I gave birth to my second child from my second pregnancy, I began hemorrhaging and I, I remember all the doctors and nurses running in because my life was in danger. And you know what my, my doctor who's trained in pregnancy and care for pregnant women, he told me that I should not have another child because my risk level of a pregnancy would be very, very destructive on my body. And my husband and I, I was a married woman. And to say, you know, I should not have another child. God blessed me with two healthy, beautiful children from two pregnancies. But I'm being told by a medical professional, do not have any more children, Brenda. We almost lost you today. So for the ignorance and the lack of compassion for women who have the amazing opportunity to give birth, to say that abortion is not a part of healthcare, because as a married woman, if for some chance I had became pregnant again, what would be my options? My husband would have to say, let's start planning your funeral. I yield back and I wish to God that when we get in our arrogant position of dictating through government, that we have respect for women and the respect for our ability to make choices on our lives. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlewoman from South Carolina, Ms. Mace, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank everyone for their time being here today. Uh, I am from South Carolina that recently uh, implemented a fetal heartbeat bill that had exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother because I put them in there. It's one of the few states in the nation that has a fetal heartbeat bill with those exceptions because I told my story of being raped when we were first debating the issue just a few years ago. And I hope that the state of South Carolina, the legislature, and the governor keep those provisions in there and also do not, uh, do not legislate whether women can go to other states or other locations if they so choose uh, from the state of South Carolina. Um, but in, in all honesty, I'm a constitutional conservative. I take the Constitution and my oath of office very, very seriously. And even Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, talked about and discussed the, the concerns that she had from a constitutional perspective on Roe v. Wade for decades. Even Joe Biden, 40 plus years ago, was talking about overturning Roe v. Wade. There are a number of folks, and it was under President Obama when he had a supermajority in the House, the Senate, and had the White House, and said that they would codify 
ratify Roe v. Wade and then chose not to because the left has used it as a fundraising juggernaut for decades rather than take the issue seriously. And now we have Supreme Court justices, we have protests and riots and folks that are showing up armed on the lawns of our Supreme Court justices. And whether you are left or right, uh, it is the third branch of government and we should not be encouraging these kinds of activities. The United States, and I don't want to forget, it's the states, not the courts, that are the true laboratories of democracy. And leaders at the federal, state, and local level are elected to represent the people in their states. And what Roe does isn't necessarily what the media has said or even some of my colleagues uh, have said on the overturning of Roe v. Wade. It is not going to eliminate women's care for a topic pregnancies, as I have heard. Uh, I had a miscarriage when I was first having my children. It is not going to eliminate health care for women who have ectopic pregnancies or who have miscarriages. And I don't know, you know, of one state, if you can mention one state that's going to eliminate health care for women whose lives are endangered. One state. Does anybody have one state that's trying to say that, that we're not going to allow any health care for a woman whose life is endangered? Is there one state that's making that a law? Go for it, Ms. Shannon. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in on that. And I'm just going to tell you what providers told me. When this issue came up in Georgia, providers told me that they were worried, even when you make an exception for um, the life of the pregnant person, that they would be pregnant mother the, for the pregnant person, female that they woman would mother, that, that they would be challenged as to when it's appropriate to make the decision to perform an abortion. And so this put fear in doctors. And I'll tell you this: you live in South Carolina. I don't know what your provider situation looks like, but we already have a shortage of specialists in Georgia. Over half of Georgia's counties do not have access to an OBGYN. We can't afford to lose doctors because they feel like they're going to be criminalized or sued civilly because they. Well, therein lies care. the debate. You bring up a that's, great point. Therein the lies the debate today is why so many women either don't have access to birth control, don't have access to medical care or health care, don't have access to understand uh, if they want to keep their child, how to give it up for adoption. Why are so many women having abortions? Why do they don't have access to care? And that's really what the debate I feel should, should be like. Uh, I would be remiss today if I didn't mention um, that uh, some of our most important constitutional decisions have overruled other prior precedents um, because there's been some mention by folks across the aisle that the Supreme Court is not legitimate. Uh, but I want to mention a few here. In Brown versus Board of Education 347 U.S. 483 in 1954, the court repudiated the separate but equal doctrine which had allowed states to maintain racially segregated schools and other facilities. Uh, by happenstance, earlier this week I visited the federal courthouse in downtown Charleston where in 1950 it was Third Girl Marshall who brought Briggs versus Elliott arguing that school segregation in South Carolina was unconstitutional. This was the first First case nationwide to challenge school segregation as a violation of the U.S. Constitution. That case would eventually become Brown versus Board, and the court has found then, as it's found now under Roe v. Wade, it was the it was the right it was right and constitutional to overturn that particular precedent. Um, I appreciate uh, Madam Chair for the time today, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, for five minutes. Uh, I thank uh, the witnesses, uh, and I thank the chair and my colleagues. Uh, in Vermont, uh, we have a constitutional amendment that we'll be voting on that would enshrine the right of a woman to make her decision about reproductive choice. Uh, we have passed a law signed by a Republican governor that would protect a woman's right to make that decision. Now, I want to say two things. Number one, I'm unaware of our U.S. Supreme Court ever passing a law or making a decision that took away a right that had existed, in this case, reproductive freedom under Roe for 50 years. I am aware of the court making decisions, as they did in Brown v. Board of Education, to expand rights that are in the spirit of the Constitution, inequality under the law, which has been the aspirational goal of our Constitution and our Declaration. But it's always been about reaching beyond where we were, as opposed to taking back what had been acknowledged. Second, when I 
uh, returned to Burlington, Vermont on the day of the court decision. There were demonstrations across Vermont. And there have been other times when I've appeared at demonstrations when an action taken by a branch of government was very upsetting to people in Vermont. And oftentimes I've experienced people's anger at the actions that were taken. This one was different. It was fear. It was fear. And it was fear about what this meant for a woman's right to make her decision about her own uh, reproductive choices. It was also fear about the erosion of privacy and what the implications were for contraception, same-sex marriage, uh, in a whole range of cases that have essentially respected the individual's right in the sanctity of his or her privacy protection. And that awaits us. The second point is that we know that abortion is a very, very uh, important topic for everyone. With our witnesses, there's some disagreement here, and it's a passionately held position. But what we had since Roe was an opportunity for people to make their own decisions and not impose their decision on someone whose decision was different. And what I've seen since the Dobbs decision is in our divided society, an escalation in the division that is really very dangerous for our country because you're seeing legislatures now pass laws that take away a right that's animated by people who not only have made a decision that they never want to have an abortion, but who then want through politics to impose that decision that's theirs onto others. And uh, I, I, I think we should all be concerned about that division. And I am hearing from medical practitioners an immense amount of apprehension that they'll be second guessed. Uh, Ms. Holly, I'll ask you, uh, Mr. Khanna had asked you about whether a woman should ever be prosecuted, and of course you answered no, and I really appreciate that. Uh, would, do you think a doctor who uh, performed an abortion uh, based on her medical judgment that that was necessary uh, to protect the, the health of the woman uh, should ever be prosecuted? Absolutely not. So I think there's two issues here. Women should never be prosecuted for having an abortion. Uh, women are, are so often harmed by abortion. They suffer emotional, uh, physical consequences. And many, well, every state uh, allows for emergency exception okay. to save the life of the mother. Mississippi allows that uh, in the uh, physician's best judgment. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Graves, uh, or Professor Graves, you had, you had mentioned uh, uh, the, 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 I think you had mentioned that the court had never taken away a right. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that in my remaining time? This is the first time in our history where we have had a court take away an individual right, and I think that's exactly why we are seeing this level of legal chaos. We have shaped our, our other laws and systems around the idea that abortion was legal in this country. And so what that means is sort of the individual and personal freedom that people had to make those decisions to plan and determine whether they have a child are no longer guaranteed to be theirs. And the fundamental floors are not state by state ideas. We're one nation with one constitution with a fundamental floor. The gentleman's time is Thank you very expired. much. I yield back. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer, is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Holly, there were no women on the Supreme Court when Roe was decided, one woman when Casey was decided, and three women when Dobbs was decided. Additionally, there are 2,295 women in state legislatures today across the country. Women are more represented in government today than at any time in our history. Members of state legislatures are voted into office by their constituents to represent their constituents. Is that correct? That's correct. The Supreme Court justices are expected to judge the law, not public opinion, correct? Absolutely. So would you agree that state legislatures are the best equipped to regulate abortion based on the beliefs and opinions of their constituents? 
So the Dobbs decision says that because abortion is nowhere within the constitutional text structure or our nation's history, then the people and their elected representatives are allowed to make that choice. Some websites such as needabortion.org are cautioning women to avoid crisis pregnancy centers, telling them that they are unregulated and unlicensed. Ms. Holly, are pregnancy centers unregulated and unlicensed? Absolutely not. And that makes me sad. We're, we're steering people away from organizations that want to help them. Do they give subpar services to women? Absolutely not. We heard testimony yesterday at the Senate hearing that San Francisco's Planned Parenthood refers uh, to uh, the Pregnancy Care Center for other services aside from abortion. I, I agree with that. The, 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 uh, with your assessment on the pregnancy centers, and can you elaborate what services do pregnancy crisis centers uh, offer to women and babies after the birth of their child? Absolutely. So pregnancy care centers strive to come alongside a woman uh, as she's pregnant and beyond. They provide you know, diapers and formula, those sorts of things after birth. They provide educational training. Uh, sometimes they'll have great fatherhood initiatives. We haven't talked much about that, but, but abortion has made uh, uh, pregnancy and childhood a woman's issue. We need the fathers to step up as well. Uh, they continue with job training services. Sometimes they help with housing and those sorts of things. And often these workers become lifelong friends and mentors. They have the picture of these children uh, up on the refrigerator. It's a, it can be a great relationship. And that's, that's been uh, what I've gathered. Uh, we have a, several uh, really impressive uh, crisis pregnancy centers in Kentucky uh, and in my congressional district, especially the one in Henderson, Kentucky, uh, just do uh, magnificent work and uh, do appreciate everything they do. Let me ask you my last question. Ms. Holly, radical groups like Jane's Revenge and Ruth Sent Us have taken credit for vandalizing church and crisis pregnancy centers across the nation. The uh, group has also tweeted locations mm -hmm. of where Supreme Court justices reside, uh, where they're having dinner, uh, they're prote they've protested outside justices' homes, and even disrupted church services. Can you, in closing, uh, tell us what impact does political violence have? on the function of our nation's institutions and on our rule of law? Well, I think intimidation and political violence uh, is intended to disrupt uh, the rule of law. And we see this with the attacks on pregnancy care centers, with the threats on justices' lives, uh, on their families. Um, and the name, you know, Ruth sent us is so ironic uh, because Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was herself a critic of Roe versus Wade for the reason she said that it was a heavy handled judicial intervention that was unnecessary and short circuited the democratic process. Mm -hmm. In addition, uh, she and Justice Scalia were famously good friends. There's a great picture of them riding an elephant together. Mm -hmm. um, and they uh, demonstrate for us that it's possible to disagree right. um, and yet be civil. I think that's a great example. I think I've seen pictures of them uh, playing cards together many times. So, uh, well, I appreciate you being here. Appreciate all our witnesses being here. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank you and Ranking Member Comer for holding this very important hearing. I also want to thank our distinguished panel of witnesses for your willingness to appear here in person and also to testify remotely. Uh, and to help the committee with its work. As a lawmaker, I'd like to turn to explore the wider uh, legal framework ramifications that this decision in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health uh, and the broader impact on the right to privacy, uh, which the court had previously held was supported by the U.S. Constitution in Roe v. Wade. You know, since it was Decided in 1973, Roe v. Wade has been cited in more than 4,500 cases, including more than 140 Supreme Court cases, more than 2,600 lower federal court cases, and nearly 2,000 state court cases. For nearly 50 years, Roe and its progeny have stood as the law of the land, reflecting a delicately, delicately determined legal balance between the fundamental right of of a woman to make a decision about her reproductive health, free from unnecessary governmental interference, and the legitimate interest of the state. But importantly, Roe also under, under, affirmed and underpinned 
and solidified the individual right to privacy of every American as derived from the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. According to the court, this constitutional guarantee to personal privacy includes, and I quote, only personal rights that can be deemed fundamental or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty, close quote. And it also extends to activities related to marriage, procreation, contraception, family relationships, and child rearing and education. In overruling Roe and disregarding five decades of carefully deliberated precedent, Justice Alito's majority opinion asserts nonetheless that nothing in this opinion should be understood to cast doubt on other precedents that do not concern abortion. But given the indispensable role of Roe and its line of cases in our rights to privacy framework, I'm not so sure about that. Ms. Gosgraves, uh, Justice Alito's majority opinion takes great pains to distinguish the right to abortion from other privacy-related rights. In stark contrast, the National Women's Law Center, uh, your institution, has warned that Dobbs, quote, lays out a roadmap for eviscerating other important rights. I'd like you to talk about that, about the wider impacts that, the, that this decision impacts those, those, those wider rights, those privacy rights. Well, the, our first major concern is that it upends the idea of the right to privacy, as you name. The right to privacy had been articulated before Roe and has been built upon following Roe, whether you're talking about co contraception or intimate relationships or same-sex marriage more recently. But the other thing that was deeply concerning about Justice Alito's opinion is he basically says that if it was not a right that was well grounded in our nation's history at the time of the 14th Amendment, it's not one that should be afforded respect. Well, women at, at the time of the 14th Amendment could not practice law, could not have lines of credit, couldn't own property separate from their husbands. Uh, you know, so if we have to go back to the rights that women had in terms of controlling our lives and future and destiny, we are all in, in trouble at that time. And then the last thing that I will just say is that totally missing from a lot of the conversation today, but certainly Justice Alito's opinion, is the right to control your own body and make decisions about your own body. That is not a small idea. It is a giant idea, and it is not a small idea to just stay pregnant or be forced to give birth. That is a traumatic idea for people in this country. Yeah, one would think that if there is a right to privacy, and, and also Justice Alito in his opinion at page nine says that uh, abortion uh, was not recognized in the Constitution, but he adds neither was privacy. And uh, it just causes me to wonder that if, if the relationship between a woman and, and her doctor about her health, if that is not within the right to privacy, I'm not sure I can imagine anything that is. And that, that causes me great concern as well. Uh, well, my time has expired. I want to thank you all for your attendance here and your willingness to help the committee with its work. Thank you. I yield back. Back, and the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Brown, is now recognized for questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and Ranking Member Comer for holding this hearing. Um, it is important to acknowledge that abortion bans and restrictions do not affect all people equally. Um, Ms. Graves, can you explain how abortion bans and restrictions impact women of color in particular? So uh, women of color are disproportionately residing in the states that are banning abortion. So that's the first thing to think about. But even if you go beyond there, right now you're going to have sort of two different situations. It is either that people are going to be able to get access to uh, medication abortion or they're going to be able to travel. Each of those things put additional hurdles that are going to come down on people very, very differently. It's not a small idea to just pick up and travel to get your own health care. It requires you to take time off, which women of color are less likely to have. It might require you to 
to arrange childcare for the children you already have. But the last point is that we should not be confused about the criminal penalties that are going to come to not just providers, but to people who are seeking care and anyone who helps them. The states around the country are not saying the things that I've heard today uh, in this hearing room about how there won't be any criminal punishment. They're saying the exact opposite and passing laws with many, many years of criminal punishment attachment. Thank you. As you explained, when we discuss the health impacts of abortion restrictions, we must also address the structural racism faced by people of color in our medical system. Um, across the United States, communities of color experience systemic health disparities, including higher rates of uninsurance and stigma. Maternal health outcomes are also directly correlated with race. Um, as we've heard a number of times in this hearing, Black women are free to four times more likely to die in childbirth. And if you are in Mississippi, that's exponentially higher. Um, Ms. Ghost Grace, if, how, do you, how do laws that force people to continue their pregnancies present unique health threats to people of color? Well, you have to start with the fact that, as you name, the access that people of color have to health care just full stop. Right now, healthcare isn't readily available in every community. People aren't always covered um, in terms of insurance. Not every state has expanded Medicaid to meet the needs of the lowest income folks. So we already are in a situation where healthcare access is worse. And so if you are choosing, in a, if you don't have an ability to decide whether or not you terminate a pregnancy on your own terms, what we know from the studies is that it is likely to have worse health and potentially life outcomes for that person. That's going to disproportionately affect people of color who already have less access to health care. And I think it's also important to note that many minimum wage workers are women and especially, uh, specifically women of color, a disparity this committee has taken on as it is working to address. Um, but for people with less income, the costs associated with abortion care, which you touched on, includes the cost of the procedure itself, transportation costs, child care, and taking days off from work already pose barriers to rece receiving it. State restrictions restrictions that force pregnant people to travel long distances to see a provider make abortion care even more unaffordable. Representative Shannon, how will the ripple effect of abortions ban on access to other reproductive health services particularly impact people of color? Well, as I mentioned before in my initial testimony, um, outlawing abortion would basically amount to that folks who have resources would be able to get access to care, which we know that black and brown folks um, are disproportionately represented in the number of um, folks who make minimum wage throughout the country. So it's going to boil down to do you have the financial resources? Do you have child care? Do you have the wherewithal to be able to travel to another state to get care, um, potentially have to stay you know, for a period of time? Um, and so all of these things are things that folks of color would be less likely to be able um, to access. Thank you. So I think um, it's pretty clear people of color already face racial and ethnic disparities related to other health outcomes from diabetes to cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. Draconian abortion bans and restrictions that force people to remain pregnant further entrench the health disparities faced by communities of color. So it is my feeling, it is our moral obligation to do whatever we can to um, lift up historically marginalized communities that look like me. And this includes protecting and expanding abortion access. So with that, um, Every person deserves the opportunity to make their own decisions about their body and their future. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, is recognized. I thank the chair, and I thank her so much for holding this hearing, and welcome to our panel. Um, Professor Goodwin, you there? All right. Ms. Goss Graves, do you remember your constitutional history? So, Ms. Hawley tells us, citing Ms. Justice Alito, there's no provision in the Constitution that says there's a right to an abortion. Show me in the Constitution where the founders in writing the Constitution granted the right to the Supreme Court to review and nullify legislation passed by the Congress or any other legislative body in America. Does that language exist in the Constitution? 
That's not how our Constitution is. No, it does not exist at all. So by Mr. Alito and Ms. Hawley's own logic, this opinion is questionable based on the Constitution. In fact, do you remember when the first time the right to review legislation or the legislative actions uh, of a legislative body was ever asserted by the Supreme Court? I, I 1804, Marbury v. Madison, and it was made up by John Marshall, made up out of whole cloth. He, he said it was an implied power. If, and if you I know, may. no, ma'am, do you remember the first time, in fact, they used that power they asserted in 1804? Because I think it's relevant. Dred Scott, 1857. That is the first time in American history a Supreme Court overruled, nullified legislation passed by the Congress of the United States. How did that work out for us? It led directly to the Civil War, directly, because it overturned the Compromise of 1850, and it asserted that no black man or woman, freed or otherwise, had the same rights as a white person. They could never be a full citizen of the United States. A wretched and reprehensible decision. And the court, sadly, along with Brown v. Board of Education, which was a good decision, has a long history. Plessy v. Ferguson, Karamatsu, lots of other decisions that tragically discriminated, in some cases almost violently, against groups of Americans. Now, in this case, it's half the population. And, all, and despite what Ms. Hawley said, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ms. Hawley said she questioned Roe v. Wade. She did, but she questioned the basis of it. She thought viability was an inferior argument compared to equality. Equality. That men and women had the same controls of their own body and should. And oh, by the way, for the record, it may be true that Ruth Bader Ginsburg played cards with, dined with, and went to the opera with Antonin Scalia. But she got up in the morning and voted against him in every single case involving the rights of women to have choice. And she upheld Roe v. Wade during the entirety of her time in the Supreme Court. Is that not correct, Ms. Grace? That is absolutely correct. So what about this equality thing? So do men have restrictions? Has the Supreme Court said, men, here are some limitations on what control you have over your own body. Any of them? I, I can't recall. I don't know of any. You don't know of any. So let's, let's just, for the sake of argument, say, in fact, there are none. With respect to women, with this decision, it's a pretty fundamental restriction on their bodies and what they can do with them. Is that correct? For sure. Now, we've heard a lot of interesting talk about states' rights and uh, when life begins and so forth and so on. Is it possible, now that we're going to revert to pre row and the chaos that reigned, that, by the way, led to just this Blackman, a Republican-appointed conservative justice, deciding we had to have a universal standard and a basic standard that was a right in 1973. Um, is it now possible that women could be criminalized and or medical providers criminalized by some states, maybe even Ms. Holly's own state of Missouri? We've already had women who have been investigated and charged for their own miscarriages. And so I... Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say miscarriage? Somebody could be charged with a crime for a miscarriage? Well, that has already happened, right? So we have already had that happen. The way that these laws are written in the states that have rapidly passed them, they would open up individuals providers and others who help them seek abortion care to criminal and civil penalties. Astounding. I yield back. Well, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, is recognized for five minutes. Is he here? He's on the screen. On the screen. Okay. Mr. Donalds. Mm -hmm. We can't reading? hear you. You've got to unmute. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. While we work out the okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, 
my question is actually quite simple. It, it, actually, it's actually not really a question. Um, Ms. Hawley, I, I, obviously, considering the last round of questioning, I wanted to actually yield you as much time as you need, four minutes and 46 seconds, or whatever you choose to use, to actually respond to some of the previous testimony in this hearing. Oh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, a few points. Uh, the Dobbs decision was a decision of judicial humility. It's a humble decision to realize that the Supreme Court aired in 1973 when it invented out of whole cloth a right to an abortion. Justice Alito's opinion is meticulous. It explores every right that has been suggested, including the equal protection right suggested by Justice Ginsburg. There are literally law review articles, law review um, books devoted to saying what Roe should have said, and no one has been able to come up with an answer that's satisfactory because there simply is no right to an abortion in the United States Constitution. And when the Constitution says nothing about abortion, as Justice Alito said, then that is an issue for the democratic process. It's an issue for the states and for the people. And in addition, this is something that protects us as American people. We don't want a system of government in which five justices who are unelected, uh, however well-meaning they may be, are able to make up things uh, out of whole cloth, um, out of the Constitution. And then the last thing I'd like to say is that there is no state law in the country, none, zero, that criminalizes women for having an abortion. We realize that this is a tough spot that a lot of women may be in. Um, we want to come alongside them and support them, and zero states criminalize uh, the woman for that decision. In addition, zero states criminalize a physician who, in his or her determination, believes that a woman needs an abortion in order to uh, have life. Uh, thank you for that, that, that uh, response. A uh, quick question, Ms. Gray, as you mentioned uh, brief, briefly that there was a, an example of somebody who was charged or potentially was charged over a miscarriage. What, what, what are the specifics around um, that example that you cited? Well, you may have seen recently in California, local prosecutors had filed charges against uh, women who were investigated for their miscarriages. That, you know, this is even before the fall of Roe and the Dobbs decision. The thing is, I, I, you know, in, in this hearing room, there has been a well, playing well, fast and Braves, loose one, with Ms. medical Braves, terms. One quick point, one quick point if, Ms. Braves, if as, I, as a point of clarity, one, one, just as a point of clarity, so the example of... So there have been over a thousand people who have been charged. ...in the state of California before the Dobbs decision? There, even before the Dobbs decision, the question of miscarriage and the investigation into miscarriage is a thing that women and anyone who's pregnant would have to, to deal with. There have been over a thousand people who have been criminally investigated um, for their pregnancy outcomes. The thing that I, I think it's important for people to understand here is that the, the medical procedure of abortion applies to multiple types of situations. I'm not sure why in this room people are suggesting that abortion isn't health care. It is. Abortion is health care. It's on the range of reproductive health care that people receive in this country. The only question is, will it continue to be safe and effective and will we be investigated and criminalized for it, either patients or the providers who provide that care? And the laws Ms. that Graves, states are- Ms. Graves, is there a state in the country right now that is seeking to criminalize or having legislation ready to criminalize um, people who seek an abortion, women who seek an abortion? So people will also be self-managing their own abortions and they will fall under these statutes well, which Graves, do provide is there criminal a state penalties. In the union is there a state in the union that is drafting legislation to criminalize There are states in the union that already have this legislation that have already been triggered into effect right now. I, I, Ms. Hall, so, I mean, Ms. Hall, what I, I maybe you're misunderstanding the, the point that 
so some people will travel to other providers and some people will self-manage their own care. Each of those people and the people who help them will find themselves in a web of criminal and civil penalties for doing what was perfectly if, legal if I may the I think you ask me a question by well, well, it, decades. Yes, yeah, with the essence of time, I'm going to yield. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman's time. Okay, the gentleman from uh, Georgia, Mr. Johnson, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Make no mistake about it. This is not uh, about states' rights. The Dobbs decision is not about states' rights. It's about taking away people's reproductive freedom while at the same time denying poor women access to health care. Representative Shannon, what have you seen on the ground across Georgia with respect to the availability of and accessibility to providers who can prescribe family planning services such as birth control and long acting contraceptives? And how will an abortion ban on Georgia affect the availability of these services? Thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned before in the testimony, and I know you know this because you represent Georgia, um, is that most of the resources are located in the metro area, which is the Atlanta area, which gets most of the attention uh, you know, in the country. People think that that's what Georgia is all about, and it's not. Most of the, of the state does not have access to uh, health care, and so that's an issue when you're thinking about having access to family planning, um, family planning tools. But also, let me just state this, contraception, is not the same as abortion. Contracept contraception is used to prevent a pregnancy, and abortion is used to terminate a pregnancy. So we can't pretend that if we just make sure that a birth control is over the counter and free, we will not have a need for an abortion. The two do two totally different things. But thank you for the question. But, it is, but isn't it a fact that uh, dispensers of, con of contraceptives also um, provide abortion services and so without the availability of abortion services you're going to be even uh, more constrained in the ability to get access to contraceptives that for some clinics that is absolutely true and thank you for bringing that up thank you uh, senator mcmorrow what will be what would be the impact of a ban on abortion in michigan uh, what would a ban on abortion in Michigan have, what impact would it have on the ability of Michigan's rural and poor women in particular to have access to nearby reproductive health services? That's a great question. I mean, right now it's already a challenge. I mentioned in my opening testimony, there are only four providers in Metro Detroit, that's where a majority of the population lives, that could provide uh, the care that, that my constituents needed. It is nearly impossible already to be able to find that emergency medical care in rural outstate Michigan. That will only become worse if our 1931 law goes into effect and will be impossible for women and families and anybody who needs to access the care to be able to find that near them. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Graves. In 2019, uh, Georgia's Republican Governor Brian Kemp signed a bill effectively outlawing abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. A federal judge struck down the law last summer, but after the Supreme Court overturned Roe, Georgia's Republican Attorney General Chris Carr has asked the federal appeals court to let the Georgia law take effect. How will ending access to abortion in Georgia impact the entire Southeast, not just Georgia. Yeah, it, you know, one of the challenges that we have is that we are already in a situation where most of the South has banned abortion. And so people who are traveling are already having to travel hundreds, if not thousands, of miles to access care. Um, and and that is mostly and disproportionately people of color because people of color are more likely to live in the South. So what is happening in Georgia is not just a problem for Georgia, it is a problem throughout that region. And it also puts an additional strain on the places that have continued to provide the freedom to decide whether or not you are going to parent. So places you know, like Maryland, 
places like DC that are now having a disproportionate amount of people who are coming to, um, to seek care here. Thank you. And Ms. Graves, between 1990 and 2013, restrictions on abortion caused the national maternal mortality rate to increase by 136%. Should we expect to see high increases like this in maternal mortality once again now that Roe v. Wade has been overruled? I think that's where we're heading, and we should all be worried about it. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, is now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And I also want to thank all of the witnesses who have been here for much of the day. For more than 40 years, the Hyde Amendment has restricted federal funds from being used to pay for abortion services. States can choose to allow their own Medicaid funds to be used for abortion but only 16 states currently do so, meaning that in 34 states and the District of Columbia, people with Medicaid coverage have to pay for their own abortion care. Uh, Ms. Gosgraves, how does having to pay for your own abortion care actually affect these women? Well, for some people, it means that they're not going to get care at all because they can't afford it. And now we're in a situation where on top of the actual medical services, we have to take into account the cost of travel, the cost of taking time off of work, the, the cost for supporting families who are, who are involved with making this all possible. And so these states, realizing the difficulty, the lack of funds, lack of resources, and lack of services have denied or are in fact denying their residents and their citizens of a basic health service? I mean, if you match up the states that race to ban abortion first, you find that they are also the states, many of which have not expanded Medicaid. They are also the states that do not have paid leave programs. This is not a, an agenda that is about supporting women or supporting families at all. Representative Shannon, what would it mean for the people in Georgia to be able to use federal Medicaid funds to pay for abortion services. Did you ask, did you ask me what would be the effect if they were able to use federal funds to pay for abortion yes, services? Yes, I mean yeah. how. Well, it, simply put, um, it would allow folks to have access to health care. So um, as Ms. Graves just mentioned, right now, um, most people are, who, depending on the state you live in, if you cannot self or cash pay for an abortion, you will not be receiving access to health care, which I would add, you know, because we know abortion is health care, you're not able to get that initial um, abortion. Forcing people to carry an unwanted pregnancy, regardless of the reasons that they are having to continue, contributes to low, uh, contributes to morbidity and also poor health outcomes. So you're actually creating larger medical bills down the road, potentially. Yeah, I would think it would be like bringing light to darkness. Mm -hmm. I, I can recall living in rural America before the REA, and when things lit up, it was just totally different. Well, as we've heard, the Hyde Amendment is an unnecessary barrier to abortion care for people across the country, and repealing Hyde is a critical step in achieving economic and reproductive justice. I'm a proud original sponsor of Representative Barbara Lee's Each Act, which would repeal this discriminatory policy. And last year, the House passed the first spending package in more than 40 years that did not include the Hyde Amendment. Of course, we'll compliment ourselves for that. And I would urge the Senate to follow our example 
and repeal this outdated amendment once and for all. I thank you for your presence and your answers. I yield back, Madam Chairman. The gentleman yields back. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank all of you again for your testimony, and I want to focus my uh, line of questioning on so-called crisis pregnancy centers and the outsized role that they may play as the Dobbs decision pushes abortion care further out of reach for millions of people. For anyone unfamiliar with crisis pregnancy centers or CPCs, there are systems of fake health, health clinics that are heavily clustered in southern states. My question, Ms. Voss Graves, is can you just explain what these fake health clinics are and how they promote an anti-abortion agenda? So someone may show up at a crisis pregnancy center believing that they are going to a place that can help facilitate access to abortion and be totally fooled. And one of the reasons why they've gotten the moniker of sort of fake clinics is that some of them have purported to actually provide health services that they do not provide. So if you are someone who's trying to access abortion, you're on a clock, more so in states that have restricted abortion care earlier and earlier. So one of the ways is by convincing people to sort of be with them and stay in their system. And, and what ends up happening is people miss out on the care that they actually are seeking. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have to say, though, uh, about these clinics, there, there is nothing that prevented them from providing the services that they provide consistent with Roe being around. They didn't have to wait until Dobbs struck down Roe versus Wade to provide access to diapers or whatever other small support they were providing for someone upon a transition in, to parenthood, and that is true more broadly. We will be now facing a much more giant crisis where accurate information is going to be so very critical. And so I'm hoping that this body and others will look really clearly at what sort of information people are providing in the name of health care at this time where there is so much deep confusion. Thank you. I, I want to discuss proportion because there are an estimated 2,500 crisis pregnancy centers in the United States, and they outnumber abortion providers by a ratio of three to one. My home state of Florida has the second highest number in the country, just trailing Texas at 150 CPCs, compared to just 65 abortion clinics. Now, Ms. Gosgrave, Florida remains for now one of the last safe havens for abortion access in the South. How do all these CPCs in Florida make it even harder to travel for abortion care? Um, I know during last year's committee hearing on Texas's six-week abortion ban, we heard a firsthand account from a woman who unknowingly walked into a crisis pregnancy center when she was seeking abort abortion care. Well, what it means is that there will be people traveling to Florida to seek care who don't know Florida as well. And so they might find themselves stumbling into a crisis pregnancy center when, when they meant to stumble into someone who could provide them with abortion services. And that would be unfortunate. Again, we are on a clock here for someone to be forced to remain pregnant, given bad information about their own health, the state of their pregnancy, or about abortion services. What we need in this time of chaos is accurate, medically accurate and legally accurate information. That's what people need right. the most. And I, I, that's exactly what I want to hit on. CPCs advertise themselves as legitimate health clinics. But staff often have no medical training and they make scientifically baseless claims to pregnant people to scare them out of getting an abortion. Uh, is Representative Shannon still with us? I'm here. Oh, great. Is it, is it, let me, I want to ask you, is it possible that residents in states like, like yours in Florida or Texas who have to travel longer distances for abortion care are more likely to end up at a CPC closer to their home? Absolutely, and this is one of the reasons that I sponsored legislation uh, my second year in office to get rid of our CPC program because, to your point, uh, these are misleading centers. We are not using hyperbole here. In our enabling legislation in Georgia, it literally said that the CPC program, which gives $2 million annually to CPCs, 
would only go to uh, places that their stated purpose was to uh, dissuade people from having abortions. So yes, CPC centers have gotten better over time as far as providing some services, but it is still the case that they literally only exist just to talk people out of having abortions that they know they want to, ha that they want to have. I had an abortion 20 years ago, I actually lived in Florida when that happened. It's a decision I don't regret. Um, and I think it's really important that when people know that they want to have an abortion, that they be, you know, able to get that care without being distracted. And as Ms. Graves uh, mentioned before, basically running out the clock, which will make it difficult for them to get the care that they know that they already want. The gentlelady is expired. That's why I'm an original co-sponsor of your bill, the Stop Anti-Abortion Disinformation Act, that cracks down on false advertising related to abortion services. And the last thing that pregnant people need now are additional forces actively trying to suppress their right to care. Uh, I yield back the balance of my, my time and thank you for this important thank you. hearing. And the gentleman from California, Vice Chair Gomez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, before I, I start on my, um, my more formal remarks, I want to kind of address, I was here for the opening statements by the ranking member, and he made some comments that the Democrats are trying to destroy democratic um, institutions and that we don't respect process. And this is coming from the same side of the aisle when it came to January 6th, that they didn't speak up. They didn't vote to impeach the former president. They haven't held them accountable. They didn't even want to put anybody on, January, on the January 6th commission. This is the same group of folks, right, that don't believe in the institution, they didn't believe in the peaceful transfer of power. Even one person on the side of, other side of the aisle on this committee said it was a normal tourist visit. As my colleagues and I were laying on the floor on the gallery with cops above us with guns drawn, we were sitting there, but no, they don't want to call out that violence that almost overthrew our, our democracy and our country. They're okay with that. And they even wanted to provide a different set of electors, but they're okay with that. So I think it's very disingenuous when they say that we're the ones that don't respect our institutions. We respect our institutions, but we also recognize that our institutions and the individuals that are placed there have a responsibility to live up to the Constitution not to their political party. They also make a claim that it's about uh, life and freedom. Well, this is, these are the same folks that, um, if you really kind of dig down, it's not about life or freedom, it's about control, right? Because if it was about life, they would take a look at a lot of their, their own states, right? What about their states? Well, if you really look at it, um, the maternal mortality rate is highest in what top 10 states? Louisiana, Georgia, Indiana, New Jersey, Arkansas, Alabama, Missouri, Texas, South Carolina, and Arizona. We have one blue state out of 10. But then when they get a chance to support life of mothers, they always vote no. When they had a chance to increase the child tax credit, that reduced poverty to from 40 to 60 percent in this country, that brought kids out of poverty, they voted no. When it comes to paid family leave, they vote no. When it comes to, uh, to expanding the ACA, they vote no. And if you look at the same states that are pulling back on uh, abortion rights and the right to privacy, that's what it's really about, the right to control your own body, are the same 12 states, roughly, that also refuse to expand the Affordable Care Act Medicaid. So it is for them, they're claiming it's about life. No, it's not about life. It's about controlling women, LGBTQ individuals. It's about controlling individuals that don't look like them, don't agree with them, and don't have the same values as them. That's what it's about. And, and when they say we are using fear to mobilize the public, it's not fear, it's a fact. Thomas said in future cases, the court should reconsider Griswold, Lawrence, and or Burglarfeld basically dealing with contraception, sex relationship, and same-sex marriage. If they get the majority in the House, in the Senate, they will pass laws that will outlaw abortion rights throughout this country. No doubt about it. It's not fear, it's fact. And this is what we're, we're, we're dealing with. 
and the people that are most likely to suffer are black, brown, indigenous, LGBTQ individuals, and undocumented individuals throughout the country. So for the panel, what do you say when these, uh, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle claim that they're pro-life? To Dr. Ms. Gross. I, you know, I think there are a lot of things you could do in support of, of life, the gun reforms that would actually make it safe for my children to be in school. That's in support of life. Paid leave, doing things to increase the maternal outcomes. There are, there's a long agenda. Many of it was in Build Back Better, which uh, not many of the folks in this room, I don't think, supported. So I, there are a lot of things that would be in support of the well-being and security of, of all people in this country that don't seem to be the agenda. The gentleman's time has expired. Madam Chair, may I respond to what the gentleman just said about uh, my opening remarks? You, we, we will give you time at the end. We're almost at the end. Let's get through the panelists, uh, the members that are still waiting all day to ask their questions. The gentleman from California, Mr. Desaunier, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to the, the panel um, and everybody who's stuck with it. So I'll get right to the questions because I know we're anxious to wrap up this um, hearing. I want to talk about the the disability community uh, and how disproportionately they are affected. Um, those impacted include a lot of people like Robin Wilson Beatty, who now lives in the Bay Area and not far from my district, and made the difficult decision to terminate a pregnancy in 2007. Had she not terminated her pregnancy, complications would have endangered her ability to care for her young son. The stigma and draconian laws uh, that Robin faced in Georgia were traumatizing and efforts for anti-abortion extremists uh, will further harm people like Robin who face tough and deeply personal decisions about their reproductive health care. Um, further, because many people who live with disabilities rely on Medicaid for their essential health care needs, um, state and federal restrictions on Medicaid coverage of abortion are particularly harmful to this community. Uh, Ms. McMorrow, how can those of us working to expand um, access, healthcare access, ensure that people living with disabilities are not overlooked as they currently fear they will be? Thank you, Congressman. I really appreciate the question because as I, I said in my opening remarks, it's really challenging for many people to get pregnant and to stay pregnant safely. And that's especially true for those in the disability community. And it ultimately comes down to, this is a healthcare decision between an individual and a family and their medical provider. Every single situation is different. Right now, the way that Michigan's 1931 law is written and our attorney general has, has mentioned this, there is an exception for imminent danger of death to the mother, but that is not defined. So it goes back to that issue, is it 50%, is it 80%, is it 20%? Uh, it doesn't factor in mental health. It doesn't factor in the issue you brought up of putting at risk either the ability to conceive again or to care for existing family. So ultimately, I think all of us in the most compassionate way need to work as hard as possible to ensure that this care is safe and accessible and is a decision that medical providers can make without arbitrary hurdles with their patients. I follow up with the, this population having been involved with them for many years. They have so many challenges. California, where I live since Pat Brown was governor, really has been at the forefront of mainstreaming people with disabilities. But the impact on they're very sophisticated about dealing with the healthcare system, both medical and behavioral health, uh, and their families and support groups. But this is just one more thing. Um, could you respond to that? It is, and it just comes down to, we've talked a lot about the Constitution and everybody's constitutional right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have to consider the additional hurdles and challenges for those in the disability community and respond in kind by ensuring that our laws um, do not add additional hurdles to ensure that everybody has that right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. 
I just follow up with it, both you and um, Ms. Lopez on the behavioral health Im implications for communities that are unique, like the disabled community, people who are disproportionately um, lower income, people of color living with stress and trauma. Again, one more thing, but a significant life transforming event for multiple people, this decision process, so they can get the behavioral health they need while they're being tugged uh, by the rest of society in this political atmosphere. Absolutely, I have concern. You know, it brings up a broader conversation of how do we expand access to health care and mental health care and wrap around supports so that everybody has the fundamental right to decide if and when to become pregnant, knowing that that impacts the family as well and that families take many different forms. Lopez, do you have any observations, comments? Um, I'm just grateful to lift up the disability community, especially rural folks, um, LGBTQ folks, and um, black and indigenous people of color. These are all the communities that are already disproportionately impacted by abortion bans and restrictions. Um, and what I've seen in helping people over the year is that over the last few years as I've been working in abortion funds is that people are so desperate they will do anything they can to get this care whether that's you know give up their rent money or like shuffle around to make sure they have child care these are things that are dire and they all play into if and when abortion is accessible thank you so much are you back gentlemen's time has expired the gentlewoman from Massachusetts Ms. Presley is recognized for five minutes Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Holly, please state for the record, when an ectopic pregnancy ruptures, what are the chances that it can be carried to term? My, under my understanding is that when an ectopic pregnancy ruptures is a life-threatening condition, that's why the treatment for an ectopic pregnancy is Excuse not me. an abortion. I'm sorry, sorry, reclaiming my time here. Again, could you just answer the question, when an ectopic pregnancy ruptures, what are the chances that it can be safely carried to term. And, and you know what, just to make this even clearer, I'm looking for a number between zero to 100. Can you give me a, a percentage? Sure, I believe zero ectopic pregnancies, even those that do not rub sure, have a chance of uh, uh, successfully being carried to term. That's why the treatment for them is not an abortion. Reclaiming my time. Uh, it seems that there is a deficit in your understanding of reproductive health. Uh, in fact, I want the record to reflect that according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, treatment for ectopic pregnancy requires ending a non-viable pregnancy. Now, let's turn... That, with respect, ma'am, that's not an abortion. This is my time. You, I asked you the question. You answered. And I'm now providing you with the accurate information from medical experts. My question was, when an ectopic pregnancy ruptures, what are the chances it can be safely carried to term? The answer is 0%. I answered that correctly, Further, when it comes to one's accurate understanding of reproductive health, and abortion care with an ectopic pregnancy, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says, quote, treatment for ectopic pregnancy requires ending a non-viable pregnancy, this is my time, end quote. That is so now I'm going to turn to the real experts. That's not an abortion because now it does I'm not have to the intent to end the life time, of a child. Reclaiming my time. I'm now going to turn over to the real experts. So, despite the active misinformation campaign that is endangering the lives of pregnant people, including much of the testimony heard here today, endangering the lives of pregnant people, their families, and entire communities, this hearing is an opportunity for quality public health education that prioritizes equity and justice in reproductive health care. Representative Shannon, I would like to ask you about medication abortion. Now, this is a topic that many are hearing about uh, for the first time uh, in the news. Since first being approved by the FDA more than 20 years ago, medication abortion is now the most common form of abortion health care. It is discreet, incredibly safe, 
and highly effective. In my home state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, nearly half of pregnancies are terminated by uh, medication abortion. Last year, Chairman Maloney and I led calls to improve access to the medication abortion drug, mifepristone, and end arbitrary and burdensome restrictions that experts agreed were medically unnecessary. And thankfully, the FDA revised its regulations so that patients can receive what many of us refer to as MIFI by mail. Uh, Representative Shannon, what does having access to medication abortion by mail mean for people in your state, particularly people of color? Yes, thank you. So as I mentioned before, most of our state, the resources are located in Atlanta. And so around the state, a lot of folks don't have access to providers. So being able to have access to medication abortion means that people can get um, access to care after they've made their decision, regardless of what zip code they live in. And we all know that forcing someone to carry a pregnancy, um, an unwanted pregnancy, leads to poor health outcomes. So having Thank access to medication abortion uh, is the right thing to do. Thank you. Ms. Lopez, based on your experience working to connect pregnant people in Texas with abortion care, would increased government support to expand abortion access, including medication abortion, benefit the clients that you work with? Absolutely, especially now that we have seen most clinics in Texas shutter, and especially because of HB2, which was passed in uh, 2013, Thank you. that shuttered the rest, over half the clinics in Texas. Thank you very much. And I think the point here is that um, pregnant people in multiple states have had emergency surgery delayed and their lives put at risk, while lawyers and doctors debate care due to confusion caused by the Republicans and this far-right Supreme Court. This is a matter of life and death. Thank you. Madam Chair, I would uh, request on behalf of uh, our side of the aisle that uh, in the future our uh, membership treat our witnesses with a little more respect and uh, not be as uh, hostile and confrontational. And I, I believe that uh, we've got a witness here today that's been uh, very uh, honest and very uh, polite in trying to answer the questions. And I just feel like uh, the last questions were a little over the line by Ms. Presley. I wanted to state that for the record. Very disappointing. Well, okay. Madam Ms. Chair. Mr. Sarbanes, you're now recognized, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you to the panelists. You've been here for a long time, but your testimony has been uh, of great consequence. So we thank you for taking the time and, and those joining remotely as well. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, as we know, many states um, already have bans on abortion in place, and we know that conservatives around the country are pushing policies to further limit women's fundamental rights in, in many, many states. Given this reality, it is all the more essential for individuals in other states to redouble their efforts to protect and expand abortion access, in a sense to be an anchor in the midst of this storm. In my home state of Maryland, which thankfully is one where uh, access to abortion is still uh, protected, uh, a new law allows certain non-physician practitioners with qualified training to provide abortions. Other states, such as Delaware, Washington, Connecticut have also recently taken steps to strengthen access to abortion care. But even when state legislatures pass laws protecting abortion care, we must continue to be vigilant. In Maryland, we've seen, for example, where the governor recently refused to release funds that were appropriated to support portions of the state's new abortion access law. Ms. Goss-Graves, um, I wanted to ask you to kind of speak to the emerging two Americas that we're seeing now, um, and in this case, to why it's critical that there be actions to expand abortion access in places like Maryland and other, uh, and other states where the, where the right is, is protected, and just speak a little bit to what you see as that, as that dynamic, because that, we are headed in the near term towards that reality, and understanding how we manage it, I think, is gonna be extremely important. You know, a little over two weeks ago, we woke up to a reality that uh, ha about half the country would be hurling into a place where you weren't free to uh, decide whether you were going to be pregnant. And what that means is that 
the one in four people, the one in four women in this country who get abortion care are going to have to figure out how to do that safely and without criminal penalties. Some will be traveling to other parts of the country. Some will be seeking medication abortion and seeking to self-manage. All of them are going to be doing it at a time of legal and health chaos. So for states that have an opportunity to expand access, that's exactly what they should be doing, protecting providers, patients, and anyone who is trying to help them. And, and in those states where they are finding that they are suddenly waking up in a place that is hostile, I, I just want to say that I see you and there are people who are fighting for you. The idea that we can stand as a nation with half more free than the other is not one that we will be able to stand very long. I believe we are hurling towards a time that feels very unsafe. And I think you're right to describe a kind of situation of chaos across the country. Um, we're seeing that with each passing day, and I think it's contributing to a, a heightened sense of kind of instability generally in the country. This is the consequence of a decision like Dobbs. You know, Maryland is one of the states that has an opportunity to be a safe haven uh, for women who live in other states where these restrictions and bans are in place. Um, but we've got to do what we can to expand and model uh, what the kind of support and capacity can look like. I also think there's an opportunity um, in states like Maryland to gather data in a responsible way that can inform uh, the, the, more, the broader conversation across the country because we know there's, we've had some debates here today over mis- and disinformation around this topic and being able to gather uh, data uh, in a way that's, that has integrity uh, to it and diligence to it I think will be important and, and, and states like Maryland I think can play a role uh, in, that, in that effort. So thank you all again for your, for your testimony uh, today. Uh, the reality is that the Democrats on this committee believe that a woman should make her own health care decisions and unfortunately it seems that uh, the Republicans that we serve with here uh, have a different view. They want to they take that agency away. Uh, we must, we will continue to do all we can to protect abortion access and ensure that all Americans, no matter where they live, can exercise their reproductive freedom. Every American, and we know that it's the great majority of Americans. What? must raise their voices in this critical moment. With that, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Before we close, I want to offer the ranking member an opportunity to offer any closing remarks that he may have. And ranking member Comer, you are now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Uh, Ms. Holly, I want to publicly apologize for uh, Ms. Presley, I, I feel like uh, that was unnecessary, uh, her tone. I uh, appreciate your, appreciate your uh, uh, honesty and uh, all the witnesses' willingness to voluntarily testify today. A couple of things, Madam Chair, that uh, I wanted to point out uh, that uh, disagreed with statements. Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz uh, continued to disparage crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, I mean, they are uh, providing a, a valuable service uh, all over America. And uh, she mentioned the word fake pregnancy centers. If there are any fake pregnancy centers that are unlicensed, then she should report them to the authorities because it's not allowed to have uh, in any state a pregnancy center that's not properly licensed. Uh, Mr. Gomez referred to my opening statement, and uh, I would like to remind Mr. Gomez, that uh, unlike Nancy Pelosi, I never voted to object an Electoral College confirmation vote. Uh, I was also on the floor on January 6th, and I've always uh, condemned the violence that occurred on that day. So I don't know where he was uh, uh, referencing that with respect to me. Look, I'm going to conclude by reminding everyone on this committee what the purpose of this committee is. It's the purpose of the House Oversight Committee is to identify waste, fraud, abuse, and mismanagement in the federal government. 
we're talking about uh, a Supreme Court case here, something that uh, we honestly have zero jurisdiction over. Uh, this hearing, Madam Chair, with all due respect, was a political hearing, in my opinion, to try to fire up the demoralized uh, far left wing of the uh, Democrat Party uh, because of uh, you know disparaging poll numbers with the, with the president and the and the party. Uh, I hope that in the future we can focus on hearings that actually identify the core mission of this committee, and that's to try to provide oversight for this Biden administration and their many policies, like their energy policy, their border control policy that are, that are failing, and try to identify wasteful spending that we can hopefully uh, reverse and try to tame inflation. So uh, again, Madam Chair, thank you for, uh, for allowing me to a closing statement, and I yield back. I, I uh, thank all of the witnesses for an incredible testimony, and I first of all want to say that Ms. Presley was perfectly within her right to reclaim her time. Uh, that's the way this body works. You have your time. The time belongs to the member, and the member can reclaim their time and behave fully within her rights as a member of this committee. I want to compliment her also for her foresight of uh, beginning an investigation with me on Mifepristone well over a year and a half ago, uh, trying to remove the restrictions that the FDA had placed on it to have access to it, which resulted in the ability now to mail it into areas of the country. That was extraordinary work, and I want to uh, publicly thank her for this. And, and uh, <laughs> I, I just, uh, it's absolutely within the realm of the Oversight Committee to look at the rights of half the population of our country. And this devastating decision is taking away a fundamental right uh, that uh, we felt was settled law uh, with 50 years of precedent, where Supreme Court justices, they, they testified before the Senate saying they would respect precedent. So this is a shocking, devastating uh, opinion. And I would say that we heard testimony today from many of our panelists of the dire threat to uh, the health of people. I think we heard that they said that uh, abortions are, are, are going to occur. The question is, are they going to be legal and safe? Are they going to be illegal and uh, increase the deaths of women? This is literally life and death to many women. We've heard that over and over again. Uh, and we all know that. We've had hearings uh, on the high incidence of, uh, of death for, for particularly African-American women with the birth of their children, eight times more likely in my great city of New York than the, than, than the national average. That's a huge problem. So it is not unusual to look at the health challenges that Americans face. And I would say that uh, most women and like-minded men in this country would be grateful for the testimony, the knowledge, and the experience that they had of, of listening to our panelists. And I would say that today we heard testimony about the chaos and confusion, uh, very beautifully explained by Ms. Graves, uh, caused by the Supreme Court's extreme decision to eliminate Americans' constitutional right to an abortion. To all of our witnesses who shared their ex expertise and personal stories of abortion, I want to thank you. And many did not share their stories, but I know their stories, and it's very brave to come forward and tell them. Today's hearing makes clear that the loss of abortion rights is devastating, absolutely devastating for women across the country, for particularly people of color, people with low incomes, and others who already face barriers to their health care. Anyone trying to downplay the damage from the Supreme Court's decision is flat out lying. And here are the facts. We heard them today. Abortion is now illegal in 16 states with more on the way. More than 33 million William, women are at risk of losing abortion rights in these states. That's half of the women with uh, 
that are of reproductive that can that are of reproductive age. Providers are scared to offer essential rep rep reproductive health care. Uh, we could not even get a provider to come in. They were afraid to come in. They felt they would be uh, hurt in some way if they publicly talked about their work. And this is in America. And people are being denied care for miscarriages and other emergencies because of these extreme state laws. When you have a, many miscarriages that we heard today are, are very health threatening. And sometimes you can't reach your doctor. Sometimes you can't even get in the hospital. And, and, and uh, it's going to cause the death of more women in this country. And Republicans are not done. They're simply not done with taking away our rights. Next, they want to pass a national abortion ban. Major leaders of the party have said that. Just ask the Republican members of this committee who are co-sponsoring a bill to make performing an abortion a crime punishable by five years in federal prison. I, I asked at the beginning of this hearing if this is the America we want to live in. We heard today a resounding no. The vast majority of Americans support abortion rights and want to make their own decisions about their own bodies. This is why Democrats are fighting to protect abortion rights. We feel we are fighting for democracy itself. If you can't make decisions about your own body, and including your reproductive health, it's, it's not a democracy. It's not a free society. Here in the House, we're taking up legislation to enshrine abortion rights in federal law. And I urge the Senate to act as well. President Biden has also taken decisive action. He issued an executive order to protect reproductive care, including access to medication abortion, and to protect the privacy and security of patients and providers. The administration is also acting to ensure access to contraception. And I have introduced a bill with many members of this committee that would prevent pharmacies from refusing to dispense contraception based on their personal beliefs. As we have heard today, the fight for reproductive rights is also taking place in, in cities and states all over our country. And I am proud to stand with my Democratic colleagues in that fight. And I'm especially proud that this committee has led the way in expanding access to medication, abortion, and contraception. This is a fight we will never, ever, ever give up. Before I close, I want to enter into the record letters, statements from NARAL, Pro-Choice America, Physicians for Reproductive Health, the American Academy of Family Physicians, and Professor Carrie Baker of Smith College regarding the urgent need to protect abortion access. I would like to just uh, say in closing, I want to thank all of our panelists for their remarks. I apologize that we had a five-minute time limit. Many of you had much more you wanted to say. You can put that into the official record. And I want to commend my colleagues, all of them, for participating in this very, very important conversation. With that and without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials and to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned.